I think we have everyone that's able to make it tonight. So now at 7.02 p.m., I'm going to call to order special meeting 329 of the Wachusett Regional School District School Committee um, held tonight via Google Meets uh, per orders of Charlie Baker, Governor Charlie Baker, back in March. Um, we are meeting tonight under a special meeting in order to conduct some timely business um, that we need to move forward before the much needed winter break um, and uh, some time to rest and relax um, for everyone on the committee, teachers, administrators, our students, uh, custodians, and everyone that's been working so hard to get our buildings ready. So first tonight are some opening remarks. Um, and I wanted to thank everybody for coming this evening. I know it is crunch time as we get ready for the holidays. I do wanted to spend a quick moment tonight um, as I was um, informed by member Silva that she may be unable to attend tonight due to um, a very recent loss in her family due to COVID-19. So if we could just take a moment out of respect for member Silva um, and have a moment of silence. Thank you. So welcome tonight here at the precipice of this holiday season one that will sure feel like no other, different, perhaps lonely, perhaps not as full as it always does, as really everything does these days. I'm reminded of what has spurred so many faiths and cultures to set aside time in winter to pause and celebrate. In each of these cultures and faiths, this celebration centers around one thing, and that is hope. Not that all is fun again or normal again, but that a better day is ahead. And we've, we've often in this committee spoken of the before times and now times. And now with the advent of the vaccines coming out to battle COVID-19, I was soon reminded today by my secretary at work that here comes the after times. Soon enough, we'll all be able to get gather, again, gather together again, to laugh, to reminisce, to hug, to have a meal indoors and maybe even go see a movie. I look forward to the days where we have all our children back in school, their teachers circulating around the room in messy group work, doing projects, sharing materials, and just being kids again. Tonight, I asked the school committee to remember that the aftertimes are coming and to treat each other with respect during this holiday season. I, like many of you, were dismayed by our last school committee meeting. There are many instances of disrespect. There are many instances of people talking over one another very little patience and quite frankly a lot of chaos. I want us to work together today to bring this meeting to a better place. We spoke about this heavily at management last week and I was reminded of that hope. Um, Kate's with us tonight and she gave a fantastic presentation, um, noteworthy of any administrator in any school district that she's going to be sharing with you guys at our next regular meeting on January 11th. And so if I'm looking towards a high school senior to be my beacon of hope. I hope that you guys will as well. And if we can behave just one ounce as well as our children have, we'll have a wonderful meeting this evening. So thank you, Kate. You you brought me back to a better place after management last week. And I, I'm not kidding. Like I, I took a sigh of relief, told myself everything's gonna be okay and that we can do it too. So thank you. First on the agenda this evening is a motion to amend the 2020-2021 school calendar. Do I have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? It's been moved second. and seconded. The calendar has been included um, in your packet of materials. Dr. McCall, is there anything you need to point out on this matter? Well, just so one of the things that we have done is that we've um, increased our um, full days on Wednesdays so that um, students will be you know, responsible for schoolwork at that time. Um, we are, you know, talking with um, all the principals about this. Teachers, um, Member Gustafson brought something to my attention earlier tonight. Malia, do you remember what it is? I think Dr. McCall's frozen. Right, that I'm following through with. Um, I can tell you, but I think, oh, okay. Um, the short version is that I have um, some, I was contacted by a couple of constituents who said that some of the teachers have been reporting in public forums that uh, Wednesdays are busy work. 
and um, extra time for Desi, but not actually, they're not actually planning to assign any work. So obviously I was concerned and, and just relayed that to the superintendent and I'm curious to hear his response. Um, so that I, I was just relaying things I had heard, which uh, were you. relevant to Wednesdays. And I think he's back. I am. So I apologize. My internet is 15 minutes before the meeting just started going off and on. So please bear with me. If I freeze, just tell me. Um, similarly, I haven't had the opportunity to look into it. Um, I will though. So thank you for sharing with me. Thank you. Um, so is there any other discussion? Oh, Member Mills, quick question about the calendar. So does the motion that we're voting on include the day off on January 4th, which I would support if it's necessary for PD, or does it not? Because I don't think it appeared on that version of the calendar, but it, you mentioned it in your discussion. This version of the calendar does not have a day off on the 4th for PD. Um, is that something that was discussed? I, I think it does. It says full does it? day, January 1st, 4th, okay. 2021. It does. But it doesn't okay. have the shoulder thing on the thing. Okay, I, I just wanted to be clear that that's, I'm, I'm in favor of it, it's fine. I just wanted to make sure that I knew what I was, I was voting on. Yep, it's not shaded, but it is listed with the half days crossed off. Any other questions or comments on the calendar so we can get this out to families? Uh, Member Otmar? Just a, a quick question. When you were looking at uh, making adjustments to the calendars, some of the things I've, at least heard discussed in other places is would basically be extending winter break. So like extending it for four days and adding those four days at the end of June. So like the 175th day would be the end of June with the idea that basically trading a remote day in January for possibly a full day at the end of June. Was there any, was there any discussion by administration in regards to that with, with looking at this or was it really just about that uh, PD day? It was around the PD days, Carl. I think I also had member Haber with a question. Uh, just a quick question. I don't seem to have the calendar in front of me, but is uh, this Wednesday a true half day or an asynchronous afternoon? I was so, told it was a true half day by my building's principal, but member Dr. McCall. Frozen again. Frozen again. I believe it is a true half day because of the holiday, not because it's a happens to be a Wednesday. This um, Wednesday, I, uh, I can answer that, Megan. Yeah. This Wednesday is going to be like our normal Wednesdays we've been having, but there's no asynchronous work for kids. Staff for staff, it's a full day. Okay. Thank you. And then I believe Member Pantos. Okay. Shaky, but no. I can, I got you now. Okay, uh, I was just curious if the administration or the school committee had previously discussed. I'm just looking for an answer to the question. I want to stop start a whole discussion. I was just curious if it had been discussed about shortening February or April break for more class mm -hmm. in person classroom time. This hasn't been discussed now. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. We're going to go to a roll call vote. Member Ayala? Ayala, yes. Oh, there you are. I didn't see you down there. You're on the bottom. You're always at the top for me. Member Bennett? Bennett, yes. Member Brown? Brown, yes. Member Dennis? Dennis, yes. Member Gustafson? Yes. Member Haber? Haber, yes. Member Ember? Ember, yes. Member Kirchenbaum? Kirchenbaum, yes. Member Lavoy? I think that's a yes. I saw it. I mouthed the yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, gotcha. Member Long Belial? Yes. Thank you, Linda. Member Mills? Mills, yes. Member Mitchell? Mitchell, yes. Member Otmar? Otmar, yes. Member Pantos? Pantos, abstain. Okay. Member Shapiro? Shapiro, yes. Member Silva is not here. Member Smith? Smith, yes. Member Sullivan? Sullivan, yes. Thanks. Member Williamson? Williamson, yes. Member Woodland? Woodland, yes. Yeah. And Member Young? Young, yes. 
Chair votes yes, and the motion passes unanimously. Next on our agenda tonight, I believe, does include a presentation by the administration. Deputy Burlow, if, if Superintendent McCall isn't able to get back on, are you able to give that presentation? I can certainly try, that's for sure. Daryl's <laughs> the one who's uh, maybe got a little more details on the slides, but I certainly could step in if needed. I'm trying to see if there's anything we can skip over right now, but I think everything else on the agenda really kind of revolves around the administration this evening. Let me send Daryl a quick text and see if he's able to get back here. So right, one good. second, please. Hi, Megan, can you hear me now? I've got you. Okay, so I have phone, but um, looks like my internet just keeps freezing, so. All right, so if I, I can guess. have Deputy Burlow pull up the slides, would you be able to talk through them? I think we could, yeah. All right. Be able to. Teamwork makes a dream work. Yes, it does. <laughs> um, Bob, could you pull up the slides and then I'll have Dr. McCall talk through them? Yeah, Bob or Brendan can both do that. Okay. I see them furiously typing at the moment. <clears throat> So as they get to the beginning of the presentation, just to let the public know, the next thing on the agenda tonight is a presentation on metrics that was requested by the school committee. So we're going to have the administration walk us through this presentation. And following the presentation, there is um, a motion on the agenda um, in regards to opening these metrics. Okay, you can back you able to see that? Is it up there? It's, yeah, up, it's there. up there. It's up there, Bob, just not at the beginning. Okay, one second. <clears throat> so I'm back on, but I don't All dare right. do this because it'll freeze. It is our last meeting of 2020, so something had to go wrong. You know it. All right, here you go. Thank you. So, um, and thank you, Bob. So uh, this evening, just a couple different things. First thing we'll focus on uh, is uh, we have the decision matrix for reopening of our schools. The other items are other items that we'll come back to uh, later on. So um, Bob, if you could start moving through. Yep. So this is a, um, this is the decision matrix for uh, reopening of the slides. Tonight we have uh, a few people from, um, the various boards of health. Brendan, can you can you tell me who's on right now? Sure. Uh, so tonight we have Julia Pingitori from the Paxton Board of Health. Uh, we also have Pat Bruckman. She's the public health nurse for Holden. She's also the chief public health nurse for the Worcester Division of Public Health. And uh, they are very busy in their roles right now. We're glad they took the time out to join us and to uh, contribute to this document. OK, thank you so much. So um, the, the matrix for reopening of schools. So again, the the past ma the matrix that was just on the screen, it's a condensed version. So what I'm gonna do is break this down for you and we'll talk through the different um, versions uh, or the different sections of it. And, you know, Pat and Julia, please join in um, as we kind of go through this. Uh, we spent, we've spent an awful lot of time on this together with the boards of health and I really appreciate the time and energy that they put into this. So again, the decision matrix for reopening schools. So we just assume that all the schools are adequately prepared for in-person um, instruction with appropriate health and safety protocols and supplies, you know, and, you know, and basically the necessary infrastructure for readiness in place per DESE and DPH. And then we're assuming that a hybrid plan is approved, which can nimbly pivot to remote learning and then back again. So we're really looking to be able to be as flexible as possible. So um, decision matrix, again, we continue um, for fully in-person learning, and that's to go back to pre-COVID times. It's assumed that transportation busing issues are all resolved, and there exist no governmental orders uh, which supersede this plan, including um, you know, things such as shutdowns and uh, other constraints such as um, desk spacing and so forth. So these are just um, really intended to serve as guidelines. And this is something that I, we just want to stress uh, in terms of what we've been talking about with the boards of health. 
Uh, we need to understand that this is um, an unprecedented time and the adjustments that might have to happen to this um, could definitely happen as more resources become available. So this is how we, this is how uh, the chart breaks down. So the first line on there are uh, av available staff resources. So we break it down by four different risk levels, starting with the risk level one, which is staffing is uh, typical for pre-pandemic levels. Moving over to risk level two, maybe 4% of staff in a school are absent due to isolation or quarantine. And I, I can tell you that is something that we are dealing with already and we're facing um, every single week uh, central office, boards of health, we are talking through these types of situations um, with staff and students. Uh, risk level three, it's about 8% of staff members. And risk level four, greater than 8%, but also, um, you know, really not having an adequate backfill in terms of nursing or other services that are really required. And again, that's, a, that's one that has, I think, this will be the one that we use probably the most in terms of how this kind of plays out because, uh, again, we will be in situations where we will not be able to sufficiently support a school or a classroom or maybe a grade level depending upon um, how many peop people are close contacts. And this is something that uh, is, is definitely going to be dealt with uh, across the board. Um, Julia or Pat, do you have anything to add to this? Um, this is Julia Convitori. Uh, so just to capitalize on what Daryl was saying was that, you know, one of the things that we had talked about a couple of meetings ago was that you might not be in a situation where people are too ill. You might be more likely to be in a situation where, um, because of quarantine and isolation, that you simply don't have the staff available in the building in order to conduct school. So. Um, I think that's what we're already starting to see. This is what was predicted a couple of meetings ago. And, and this, I think, is going to be a primary limiting factor. So it's appropriate. Pat, do you have anything? Sure. This is Pat Bruckman. One thing I will say is the time for the school nurses and for the administration to contact Trace is very labor intensive. Uh, so that's something else you need to take into effect when we start to get to these risk three and four um, levels, the time needed from by your staff to do these appropriate contact tracing um, is really taking away from the things that they should be doing for the students. Um, and most certainly with the upcoming holidays, you know, I think I'm very grateful that the schools are on a break, but what parent, families do over those holidays is going to affect what happens when you return to school after the break. So I just want to you know, bring that up because we most certainly did see an effect from Thanksgiving. Yeah, thank you, Pat. Um, and, and again, I, I believe people are already predicting that there will be another I'll jump in here until Daryl comes back. The next slide deals with available PPE and cleaning resources. And uh, it starts out, first of all, talking about months of supply that we have on, on hand. And it ends up if we get shorter than uh, two to four uh, weeks of supply. That's our risk level four. Uh, Julia or Pat, did you want to add anything to this here? Yeah, I think part of the concern, this is Julia, part of the concern with uh, having two to four weeks supply, even though it, it sounds like it's, it's kind of a lot, is that if we get down to that level, we more than likely are seeing shortages and would not be able to resupply ourselves. Yeah, and that's a great point. And that's one of our concerns here. We're trying to stay months ahead. If something is backordered or we just cannot get it anymore, if we get down to that level, I agree that probably is because we can't resupply at that point. Pat, were you good with this? No, I'm fine with that. It is the fact that you may not be able to resupply that is the most concerning. The uh, third uh, criteria that we had here is uh, in terms of state and regional healthcare resources. 
uh, and this is the impact to hospitals, those types of things uh, due to surge that we're, we're seeing. Um, risk, uh, the green is essentially there's, there's very little, and as you move up, the uh, hospitals are using much more of their available capacity to do this in terms of almost reaching capacity, and that's where we get into the red up there. And maybe, Julia, you could speak to this in a little more detail. Right, so this is intended to align a bit with the hospital phases, um, you know, where uh, hospitals are, are currently um, in a phase, I believe it's phase one of their emergency response right now where they're starting to divert uh, to expansion spaces, um, staff are being redeployed, um, and they're unable at this point to have any uh, elective procedures go forward. Um, and this, this uh, domain is really about being responsible for our community at large, recognizing that if the schools open, it could contribute to spread of COVID-19 and therefore put additional strain on our hospital resources. And as you know, as we've discussed before, once those hospital resources are strained to a certain extent, then even routine care, um, other emergencies besides COVID-19, it's gonna be more difficult for those people to obtain the emergency services or, or other care that they need. And so this is about responsibility to the larger community in my eyes. Oh, Pat, did you wanna to speak to this as well? One thing I would like to say, we are seeing this already at some of the hospitals, they're having difficulty because of the number of staff that are either out on isolation or quarantine. So we're already seeing some of this happening. Sporadically, some of the hospitals have uh, reached capacity in some of their ICUs and whatever. Um, not so much at UMass, not at, you, oh my God, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> not, at, it's getting late. Not at UMass or St. Nice, but some of the smaller um, hospitals in the region have had some issues with um, reaching capacity. And, you know, again, with the holidays coming up, if people do not do what's what they should be doing responsibly, we could end up seeing that surge, which would push us over the edge. And we thought it was very important when we're reflecting on what criteria we might give here. Some of these would be things we're very much in, in control of locally, like PPE, available PPE. Other things we have to pay attention to what's going on in the community, such as what, what, what's happening with our hospitals, what can they handle right now? So, and, and you'll see as we move on, there's even one from the Department of Education that we, we had to include in here as well. Daryl, are you back with us? Did you wanna pick up here? Yeah, I'm back. So um, are we on slide eight or nine right now? Presence of multiple cases, Daryl, in district schools. Thank you very much. So. Um, Again, this goes back to what Bob just mentioned, and it was the DESE uh, kind of um, guidelines that they recently updated and shared. So um, basically, we go from a risk level of no confirmed COVID cases uh, to circumstances where there are multiple cases in multiple schools across the district for risk level four. Uh, so again, they break it down. Um, if you look at the risk level two or risk level three, even um, on the orange risk level three, if you go down probably uh, three quarters of the way down, they talk about closing part of a school for a short amount of time um, for an extensive cleaning, or they you could close a school partially or, or longer for a full duration, including a 14-day quarantine period. And any, Pat or Julia, any comments on that? So when we were talking about this particular um, domain, we were focusing on originally the concept of uh, community transmission or community spread of disease. And that community spread is one of the major factors that we look at when trying to make decisions around opening and closing. And, and that's a, um, a, an unfortunately a, a major concern, but also not one that is well tracked right now. So the way it's defined for community spread is whether the cases that are coming up, if they have had a confirmed um, close contact with a positive case, or if they don't know where they picked up 
um, the illness. So in the cases where we know that they had a confirmed contact, we don't necessarily, and it sounds a little bit weird, but we don't consider that community spread. It's a known transmission as opposed to unknown transmissions where it's prevalent enough in the community that they're picking it up somewhere, they don't know where they picked it up, and that's where things start to get a little bit more concerning. Now, right now, there's not really a good metric to lean on to get good solid numbers for what is community spread. Uh, only recently, the state started tracking this uh, as we are collecting information with our contact tracing. However, that information still is not great because the um, places that are doing the contact tracing, the local boards of health, um, Worcester Public Health, the Contact Tracing Collaborative, are really struggling right now to keep up with volume. And so that's probably not really reliable just yet. So this is another way of thinking about it. And as um, Mr. Burlow said, it, it, it is coming directly out of DESE. So um, we're looking at this as being an indicator of community spread that, that's actually probably more in tune with our school district um, than looking at a metric from the state. Thank you, Julia. Pat, do you have anything to add? Okay, go ahead, Bob. Daryl, I was just going to tell you, I moved on to slide 10 for you. Thank you so much. So community positivity rate, uh, again, these are numbers based upon um, the positivity rate of uh, testing coming back from the community. So, you know, we have a risk level from 1.5%, um, 0 to 1.5. On, at one to a risk level four of 5% or greater. So we can tell you that um, for the most part, we've had quite a few um, weeks where we've been over 5%. Most of our communities, um, in fact, have been over 5%. So I think that number is starting to come down a little bit right now. Um, and again, we had, we had a pretty fruitful discussion about that at our last uh, Board of Health meeting. And Julia and Pat, if you'd like to talk about that a little bit as well, that'd be great. Yeah, so this number is tough, right? Because um, it's hard to judge your community positivity rate unless you're sure that you're discussing apples, um, you know, comparing apples to apples. So because of the way this number is generated, it's highly dependent on the number of tests that are being administered as well as the reason that the tests are being administered. And so without those variables that produce this number being constant, um, the, the meaning of this number may change. So that's something that we have to kind of keep in mind with this particular metric. But I can tell you that if you're looking at these numbers and sort of wondering um, you know, where they're coming from, if you think of green as being, you know, the risk level one as being sort of pre-pandemic levels, we haven't seen that since the pandemic started really. Um, we are now looking at, if you were to, to pull up the data from July of this year, you'd see some 1.7s, a 1.6 in there in terms of what our positivity rate was. And that 1.6 fell, it looks like on July 19th. Um, if you go forward and start looking at where things started to pick up, um, once you start getting into November, November is where we hit that 2.5% positivity, and that was in the first week of November. And if you remember, um, there was a lot of concern happening then around um, the advent of a second surge of COVID. Um, and then if you were to look at our metrics now, our as a state, um, our positivity rate currently is 5.8%. Um, and you and I think we all are aware of where the state is at right now in terms of um, numbers of cases and how concerning it is. Great, thank you, Julia. Pat, do you have anything to add to that? Sure. I mean, I was just pull. I had just pulled up some of the um, numbers just for Holden, and the last Jul uh, July, November eighteenth. The holding was yellow at 3.4% positivity rate. Um, and right now, as of 12-17, um, you're at a 5.6 positivity rate um, and you're red. That has certainly come down a little bit from December 10th, which was the high for that um, five or six week period. But again, when coming into the holidays, I expect to see the same thing happen post Hanukkah, post Christmas, post New Year's that we saw post Thanksgiving. Um, and one of the other things that we look at when we're 
it's not only the state rates that are posted, we also get data from the epidemiologists at Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and we get a positivity rate that's based upon individual unique tests and the positivity rate. And that um, last week with incomplete data when it was reported was 15.22% for Holden. So you can see there's a little bit of a discrepancy depending on how you're counting the tests. The state data counts the overall tests, no matter how many tests are done for one particular individual. These are individual unique tests that we get on the data from the epidemiologists. So um, depending on the data that you use and then adding, you know, averaging it for all of the member towns of the district, you could end up really quite high post the holiday surge. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. So um, the, the last slide here goes along with just responses that we could possibly have. So response level one would be full in-person learning um, with the exception of cohort C, which is the remote uh, group. And response level four would be all students fully remote, except for those most at risk um, that we have to have in person. So, um, and again, these, these all go back to just different triggers or levers, if you want to um, kind of put it in that way. That way we're talking about, you know, we don't have to say, okay, we have three red, two greens and a yellow. Um, what we're trying to do is look at this and say, okay, there are going to be some that just pop up. So for example, if we ran out of um, PPE supplies, it doesn't matter what all those other things really said, because we wouldn't be able to put kids into the building safely. So um, that, that's something that we've been talking about at length um, with our, our boards of health and looking at um, you know, where we might be going. So we know that there was a, and we did talk about this, we know there was an uptick in numbers after the Thanksgiving holiday. We are anticipating an uptick in numbers after the, after the December break, which is one of the reasons why we had made that um, kind of request to have uh, the reopening occur uh, later on in January. So again, all of this comes back to looking at where we are right now, where we might be, what we have for staffing, what we have for um, positivity rates and so forth. So um, again, boards of health did a fantastic job, you know, working with us on this. Um, kudos goes out to Julia Pinchatori and Brendan um, for really working hard on this. Um, and um, I think that's where we're at, Julia or um, Brendan or Pat, any, anything else? Yeah, I think um, it's important to reiterate that this is a guideline. Um, it's intended to prompt the conversations uh, that need to happen to decide if we are um, safe to be in school and, and at what um, capacity we are safe to be in school. Um, this is taking what is a very gray situation with lots and lots of variables and really trying to simplify it down to um, sort of the, the major four things that we're looking at in order to help guide our decision making. By no means is this to be considered um, the end all be all, and it is definitely not taking into account all of the other factors that go into this decision, such as what the detriment is for, for kids um, not being in school. So I think that it's important to, to recognize this is really just a guideline and that, you know, as Daryl um, commented on a few minutes ago, you know, you may end up with um, different criteria in different risk levels, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to change your um, your response, right? So you could have um, one risk level in the, the risk level three or the orange column, and the rest are all in um, level one and level two. And so your response may not need to go to, to level three or um, uh, that was a, almost all remote. Um, so, you know, it's, it's going to be a conversation. This is a guideline. And I think it's, I can't emphasize that enough. Thank you so much. Okay, so that's, thank you, Bob, for taking over. I appreciate that. I'm staying on my phone just in case, so I do have, the internet is working, but I don't feel like having it freeze again and not be on the phone, so I'll run them both. 
Um, I'm going to give committee members then some time right now to ask some questions since we do have members of the Board of Health here. Um, while we have some time, I'm going to keep this conversation to about 20 minutes so then we can move into our motion. Um, but I do want to be respectful for the, the fact that we have, um, before you guys go to the hand raise, so one of the issues we had last meeting was that there were so many hands raised in the chat that it was impossible, literally impossible for me to keep, keep up with. Um, so we're going to go back to just the alphabetical list for this evening to kind of keep things flowing more naturally. If you don't have a question, you don't have to speak, and that's totally fine. Um, but when we go to like a billion hands raised in the chat, it's it's impossible to do guys. Megan, do you want me to keep time? This is Christina. Christina, love you so much. Do you want me to read the first one? Yes, two minutes okay. if you don't mind. Thank you and so then much. I'll just okay, sure. Thank you. Um, we're going to start with Member Ayala. If you have a question or comment to the boards of health, I guess this is probably really general because there's probably really no answer. But um, I guess where our target date is January 19th um, to go back. And in your opinion, I wanted to see. I wanted your opinion on the likelihood of our district getting back at that point. Is that a question more to Dr. McCall or, or to um, the boards of health? I guess to the to the boards of health, it, how likely at that point, because we'd be after the holiday break and hopefully things start calming down again, hopefully. Um, and I think a lot of parents are just questioning, like, are we even gonna get back into school at this point? Um, so I guess Board the Health, if they have any input on if they foresee us getting back for January 19th. Thank you. I can respond to that. Thank you so much. This is Julia. So, um, you know, it's a tough one. It's really going to be highly dependent on how well people adhere to guidelines over the next few holidays. Uh, what we saw with Thanksgiving is we saw the definite uptick about five to seven days later um, from the, from Thanksgiving. Um, but we saw that that continued not just for that short period of time, it continued over the next two, two or three weeks. So um, if you were to then apply that to say Christmas and New Year's, potentially we'd be running into a situation where cases are still high as of January 19th. But it's really going to depend a, a lot on whether people, you know, learned from Thanksgiving and, you know, decided to take a different route or not. Thank you. Uh, Patricia, anything to add? Um, no, I will say that, you know, we do expect a two or three week surge, as Julia was saying. Uh, we've had other um, school districts we've had conversation with, and that is one of their main concerns is if they go out, will they get back? especially after the, you know, whether they, whether they choose the 11th or the 19th, et cetera. And again, it depends on the numbers. And as Julia said, everyone doing what they need to do while they're on break for a week and a half. I mean, it's a nice long break. Again, granted, we're not, no one's going anywhere. No one should be visiting. But we can't control what people do outside of, you know, school in their own, in their own homes. Um, so we're hoping that people heed the advice, but again, if everybody goes out and does whatever they want, um, you know, the 19th is up for grabs. I would love to say, yes, you can make it for the 19th, but it depends on what everyone does and we have no control over that situation, unfortunately. It sounds like your very stern advice though, is to stay home with your immediate family. Well, that's what maybe, I'm planning maybe, on doing. <laughs> maybe go for some nature walks. With yeah, with your masks on and socially distanced, because if you look at this evening's telegram and gazette, people went out sledding and everyone was piled up like little. So you know, again, you're outside. Maybe it's you got air moving and whatever, but still, still need to use your distancing and masking. Thank you, uh, Member Bennett. Comment or question? Um, just a, a a quick one for the the. Um, members of the, the health board. Um, there has been some uh, conversation about uh, distancing um, and uh, 
I was just wondering how you how you felt um, was or what you feel is best for distancing um, between like three and six feet. Um, what you feel is is a, an appropriate amount of space uh, to stop spread or to uh, slow spread. Okay, this is Pat Brockman. I can answer that. Um, most certainly we want at least the six foot spread, if at all possible. In some schools that six foot isn't possible. Um, and it only means that there's more people that would be considered close contacts. So we are working with each school district individually um, when they have a case and discussing this with the school nurse to determine who should be considered a close contact and who should be put out of school. If people are greater than six feet apart, we usually don't have to put out any contacts. Thank you. Uh, Member Brown, any questions or comments? I'm sorry. There is one oh, more sorry, part, but just I'm really sorry. quick. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, so then, uh, for example, you know, on on the buses where it is a little bit more close uh, contact, then, um, uh, you know, how do you feel about the? I guess how do you feel about the busing system and that being far closer than six feet? The school districts that I've been working closely with, with busing issues, they have um, video camera on their bus and we've been utilizing that and reviewing that to determine who's a close contact. Uh, most certainly you have to get these kids to school. And if you have to be totally six feet apart, you're gonna be riding, running a bus with what? 10 people on it maybe? Um, so it may not be possible for you as a district to do that. And we take that into account with each person. I mean, there's not a lot you can do about it. You need to get kids to school. Thank you. Member Brown. Hi, um, I wanna thank Julia and Patricia for coming um, and speaking at our meeting. Um, my uh, question is, it, it, you know, we, we're looking at uh, January 19th. Uh, we are going to be discussing about maybe bringing students in before. Um, would you recommend that um, at this point? Before January 19th, bringing some grades in? Since all, I mean, I'm looking at the five towns right now and, and we've been read for, for a while. And uh, with the holidays coming up, and as you said, there's probably going to be a spike after. Um, what what would be your recommendation? I can respond to that. So Scott, thank you for your question. Um, I can't say that I could get behind moving kids in earlier. Understanding that um, there should there will likely be a lot of cases that are developing um, de novo following the holidays. So um, at the January 4th mark, I think we're still seeing a lot of um, situations where there would be people incubating virus and not necessarily showing signs or testing positive yet at that point. So I think you'd be running a, a risky situation where you could have a, potentially a lot of people that are in the incubation phase and becoming positive while they're at the school. Thank you. Thank you, Member Brown. Uh, Member Dennis. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I saw that uh, Asima was trying to, I think she has to jump off and wanted to jump in. So I'm happy to yield my time to her. Thank you. Member Silva, do you want to hop on now? Yes, I'd love to, Megan. Um, I actually have to hop off in a few minutes. And I apologize going out of order. Um, as uh, I had emailed uh, the school committee members, and I'd like the community to know that I just lost my <laughs> uncle this morning to COVID. I just returned back from the cemetery and my question is to the Board of Health because I'm concerned about the metrics that the Board of Health is laying out. So my question is, in my experience with my uncle's experience, I have seen healthcare workers overworked. I have seen hospitals being overwhelmed. So when these metrics are being laid out and recommended for schools to open, are they considering what impact it will have on these hospitals? Because I am going to quote what one of my family members' doctors said, 
is once you are in, you know, once you are admitted as a COVID patient, you become a number at this point. You are no longer a family member and a loved one, because that is the only way they can take care of these patients. And it concerns me with these metrics. How are these metrics being, you know, uh, outlined? Because are we really outlining these metrics as how many numbers can we just barely support? Or are we outlining these numbers to make sure that each individual who gets COVID can still be treated like a family member and a human being? Thank you so much, Member Silva. And again, our deepest condolences. We did um, have a moment of silence at the beginning of the meeting. Um, Patricia or Julia, any, any thoughts just to, you know, where do these metrics lie in regards to taxing our healthcare system and providing true care for the patients that are in hospital? This is Julia. Um, Member Silva, I, I deeply regret that you lost your uncle and I'm very sorry to hear that. I wish your family peace as you move on from this. Um, you know, th this is a hard thing to address. We um, put hospital status in the metrics so that we can keep this in mind. The whole COVID pandemic is a balancing act. Um, it has been a balancing act from day one um, between, you know, keeping the economy open, but also trying to, to prevent illness and, and prevent these unfortunate outcomes. Um, and again, that's what we tried to do with these metrics was balance the importance of bringing kids back to school for in-person learning with also, you know, keeping in mind the greater community and the, the status of our healthcare system to try to ensure that we're not overtaxing. Um, I think we tried to set these pivot points at a place where we felt more comfortable um, that we weren't contributing to a, a larger impact that, that could overwhelm the healthcare system, but no situation is perfect. And again, this is a, a very delicate balancing act um, that we're trying to, to accomplish here. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think the community members and parents need to be aware of that, that these guidelines are a balancing act so that they can make the best decision for their families. Thank you. Thank you, Asama, and, and, and please don't feel like you need to stay on with us. Family is always, always more important. Member Dennis? I have uh, no questions at this time, thanks. Thank you. Member Gustafson? And, and Malia did alert me before the meeting. She's having a hard time with her asthma, so to bear with her as she speaks. It's, I'm all right at the moment, so we'll, um, we'll hope that stays. Um, I had, I think I had two questions. If I, um, I guess one of my questions is, is there any way to make this, I know we've talked a lot about kind of families having some sense of where we are in the past. And I wondered if it's possible to have um, perhaps like a weekly update where this is added to the dashboard so families can see where each of these metric areas where we're falling from week to week. I know it changes quickly, but with things like PPE, there might be some way to, you know, you can see that. Um, I don't know if that's possible, but it may give people a sense of where we fall. Like right now, I don't know where we fall in all four of these. I know where we are as a whole, that we're in remote learning, but I don't know where we fall in each of these um, metric categories. And I think it would be helpful if there was some way to create some sort of way to update us on that. I know you have weekly meetings, so perhaps weekly or, you know, whatever makes the most sense. Um, so that is one question. Um, I'm almost seeing member Gustafson in like a, almost like a separate half to the COVID dashboard that we have. Yes. Already. That so had we where we that fought, and then you would have to follow that type of yes. thing. I mean, I don't know formatting, but it's just, theoretically, just usually, usually theoretically, I'm that's what I was thinking. If you throw this up, you could identify from week to week where we fall. Like right now, we're in risk level one for, you know, PPE. Or where, I don't know where we fall, as I said, right now. And that may be helpful just in, in giving people some additional data. Yeah. So um, that's a good, good direction to the administration. So that's one. You said you had a second one, though. I want to make sure. We yeah. That. My other question um you touched on one of them. My other one was how this affects things um, like athletics, because we just talked about that a little bit in business and finance. And I was curious, you know, are athletics going on no matter what risk level we're at, or are those also impacted 
um, under this because the rates have gone up and, and that's a concern. I know we've had cases in the state spreading through athletics. I know it's hockey season. That's been a huge concern. I'm actually, frankly, surprised our hockey team teams are still playing. Um, so let me, because, let, me, let me ask them that question. So yeah. do these metrics then affect um, MIAA and sports? Dr. McCall, would you have that answer? Yeah, so it's not necessarily MIAA because everyone follows a different metric. Um, you know, unfortunately, that's one of the reasons why uh, school districts are kind of in the positions that they are in um, because there, there were really no metrics. MIAA uh, does want to give kids the opportunity to play um, some of these different activities. And, you know, thus far we're looking at it um, as, you know, being able to, but we're going to come back to these metrics now that we have uh, something that's a little more solid and uh, really utilize that because, again, we don't want to put, um, as, as you said, Malaya, there has been spread, uh, particularly amongst hockey players um, over the past um, two months or so. So we want to ensure that we're doing everything we can to keep that down. Well, and I know they take buses what? and and other yeah. things. Yep. So I just want to make well, sure. I know other other uh, towns have had to stop athletics um, at various points this Thank fall you. in. So I wanted to make sure we were factoring that in. Thank you. Yep. And that first question, go, going back to uh, updating some type of met, um, metric associated with the matrix, uh, we, we did talk about that with the Board of Health. Uh, they were a little concerned about trying to get information like the, especially around the hospital, hospitalizations and so forth, trying to do that on a weekly basis. We could definitely look at trying to do that on a um, you know, biweekly basis, um, which is, I think, worthwhile because, again, I want to be able to show where where we are in reference to this particular model that we're using. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. And thank you for, thank you for that clarification. Um, and again, remember when we come to you, uh, we're trying to add to the conversation. So something new. Member Haber. Uh, just a clarification. Based on our next motion, it says we're approving. Are we actually approving this um, metrics tonight? Is that the goal or? Our next motion is to go to um, the students in the different grade levels, but if someone would like to make a motion in regards to these metrics, I would not be opposed. Is it necessary, though? I it guess is it's not necessary. Question. This is not something that we've been asked to do um, by Desi or MASC or anybody, but if we would like to, it, it wouldn't hurt. Okay. Member Imber? Uh, first, I'd like to thank both uh, Julia and um, uh, Pat for coming to our meeting and, and certainly for all the work on this. Um, yeah. I, I'm looking for a sort of clarification. Pat mentioned that um, I, maybe I misunderstood, but that contact tracing in the schools was going to be or is our responsibility. And I, I guess I had always assumed that that was the responsibility of, of the local health departments. So, so if I could get a little clarification, that would be helpful. Thank you. Sure, this is Pat, I can answer that. Every time there is a student or a staff member in the school that is positive, I speak with the school nurses to help determine who in the classroom or on the bus is um, a close contact so that we can exclude them from school immediately. So that's that extent of it. And then we go on to contact the close contacts once they're excluded from school. But I work very closely with the school nurses in all of my districts to determine who we had contact with that student in the classroom or that teacher in the classroom or um, on a bus or on a sports team, et cetera. Because I would have... <laughs> Sorry, that, that helps a great deal. Okay, thank in, you. In understanding how that works. Thank you. Okay, again. You're welcome. And, and thanks for your help in all of this. And thanks for being on with us tonight. Really, like, uh, Julia, you had something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to um, comment. What Pat said is 100% is correct, um, but we rely on the um, administration and the, and the nurses to tell us who those people are. So um, they would need to, you know, if you think about um, assigned seating in a classroom, the model that's been presented by the state is that the um, school nurse would hold on to all of the assigned seating charts and then would give that information to us around who would likely be a close contact. Um, and any other 
situation where there might have been a close contact, whether the teacher um, in a particular classroom ends up being a close contact because they, you know, had 15 minutes of cumulative time spent with the positive case. So we rely on the school for that part of it, but as far as, um, you know, the rest of it, we take care of that. Again, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Member Kirshenbaum. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if um, anyone could speak to um, transmission, current data and current literature on transmission in schools. I know that uh, we just made the comment that uh, some athletics are finding there's, there's transmission. Um, I'm wondering if you can um, speak about any of the transmission that may or may not be occurring in schools. Thank you. So to Julia and Patricia, any evidence of spread in schools, um, especially with the fact that students typically aren't being tested? Um, this is Pat. Again, when we're relying on transmission in schools, we're looking, as Julia had said before, do we have any other known contact with a positive case outside of school? So let's say, for example, if a neighbor, another family member that the person had contact with, if they have had contact with a known positive case outside of school, we do not consider that in school transmission. Um, with a couple of the schools I've dealt with, we've had some minor evidence of possible in school transmission, nothing concrete. Um, and we have called on the rapid response team to you know, test on a very limited basis. But again, when I'm not seeing right now large wide school spread. Thank you. Um, Member Lavoy. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, a little a little funky, but not too bad, Matt. I have a quick question um, for Julia, and then I have a follow-up to something Pat had just said. So, Julia, I think on the stats that you had shown on community transmission or you talked about, you are reading some stats, and I think you had said, when we saw the increase at 2.5%, it was somewhere in November. Could you give us an indication at what those were maybe at the beginning of September, the beginning of October, uh, when the numbers perceived to be lower? Bear with me just one second and I'll get okay. you to that. All right, and while, while Julie is getting that, I can, you know, I just want to ask a question on, um, Pat's comment on not seeing a high level of transmission in school. Is there an opinion on administration or this district offering COVID testing for teachers, perhaps on a weekly basis as a mechanism to help keep that number down? Do you have an opinion on that? Matt, do you want the administration to answer that second one or do you want the boards of health? I'd like to hear from both of them, whoever would, whoever would want to address it. I think it's an important question to have answered. Me too. Thank you. Um, so this is his second question. So maybe Dr. McCall, while Julia is looking up those metrics, um, would you find it important to, I believe he stated, to test staff weekly um, in order to really get a feel on if their school spread? Uh, yeah. So I think that's one of the things for us as a district with 1,100 employees that would be a challenge. Um, it would be a challenge to have it done and it would be a challenge to, I think, pay for it ultimately. Um, I am reaching out to DESE about um, some of the testing that they've made available to some districts. So um, I'm hoping to get some information from them um, I, probably next week now. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, in a perfect world, um, we'd have everybody tested um, so we can get a baseline and, you know, be able to, you know, ensure that people coming in and out of the buildings um, aren't COVID positive. Thank you. Uh, Pat or Julia, your opinion on that? I know Julia's looking up some numbers. So, Pat, do you think it would be beneficial to test teachers? You know, again, I'm not 100% sure it would be in some respects because it is a point in time test. You know, you, and if you're testing weekly, there is a chance that you could have a test on a Tuesday, the teacher tests negative four days later, they could be, have been, they could have been exposed in between that time. And then 
end up being, you know, positive in between that time. Again, another um, factor to take into place is the cost of doing this on a weekly basis. As um, he said, there's 1,100 school employees. Um, I think if you're relying on the test only, I think it's just as important to rely on a very good screening of your staff when they enter the building, you know, and for people to be cognizant of even the most subtle symptom that could be COVID. Not yeah. only just the testing, you know, you don't want to, testing's good, but it's also important that people, you know, pay attention to that subtle stuffy mm -hmm. nose, that scratchy throat, um, just feeling different from their norm, you know, and thinking it could be COVID versus relying on the testing. Yeah, I can add to that. Um, you know, if you're testing just staff, um, you, you're not hitting the full, um, the full benefit of surveillance testing. Um, the other thing is, you know, surveillance testing works best when it's done multiple times a week. Once a week generally is insufficient, um, is what we've seen with the colleges. So um, twice and three times a week is more effective uh, if you're going to rely on, on test results. And for the reasons that Pat just spoke about, that, you know, it is a point in time test. It only tells you if somebody has enough virus in their system to test positive on the day that their test is collected. Um, that could change the very next day. So it works great when it's done frequently and when it's done with everybody. But if you're not um, doing it frequently and if you're not testing everybody, it's it becomes much less effective. Thank you, those are great points. And Julia, were you able to find those metrics that Matt was asking for? Yes, so I have those. So if I'm looking at September, um, we had an average weighted uh, molecular test rate of 1.7% uh, at the beginning of the month. Oops, I'm sorry. 1% uh, at the end of the, at the beginning of the month. Um, and then if I look at October, um, it was, bear with me. In October, it was 1.1%. Um, so we're right about 1% for both months. Um, the interesting part of this though, and, and something to keep in mind, is that in September, we started having colleges return to campus. And so we had a lot of tests um, being conducted which is um, a, a great um, segue from the prior conversation because there was surveillance testing that was being done. So individuals were being tested multiple times per week. In September, the state hadn't yet broken that down, but by October, we started getting some breakdown of um, what that looked like. So that at that point in October, the state provided um, a percent of tested individuals who are positive versus a percent of all molecular tests that are positive, which still isn't great because, um, you know, you're testing, you could potentially end up with an individual test positive more than once. But um, so when you look at it that way and you're looking at the percent of tested individuals, it is now um, for October, it was 2.7% versus the 1% that I told you a moment ago, that 1% takes into account um, all of the college surveillance testing that was happening at that point. Member Lavoie, does it answer your question? You're nodding. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Um, Member Long below. Megan, you're at uh, 30 minutes for this conversation, just so you know. Thank you. Um, I think everything so far has been new. So as long as we keep adding new points, um, I'm actually learning a lot tonight myself. Thank you, Christina. Linda? So I'm curious as to whether, I, I have two questions, I'll be quick. I'm curious as to whether schools have closed based on these metrics and whether schools have, conversely, schools have stayed open um, despite these metrics, um, open in hybrid form, I mean. Um, and then my second question is, are you taking into account the fact that we had, uh, we have a, a volunteer crew of contact tracers, people in the community, medical professionals who have volunteered to contact trace um, are you taking that into account when you're looking at the overall picture for the, regarding the metrics? Thank you. Uh, Julian, Pat, just from your experiences with other districts, um, are similar metrics being used? Would this Has this been something to open and close schools? So um, I can tell you that I don't know of any other district that 
has specific measures set up quite as, um, I, I guess, quite as nicely as this is set up. Um, a lot of other districts are looking at this um, primarily from a, a perspective of just simply having a conversation when things start to go awry. And um, my understanding is that one of the major limiting factors that has forced uh, a number of districts to go remote more recently or schools to go remote more recently is, is simply the staffing issue. And Pat can probably comment further. None of the other districts I work with have this type of metric. What we do is we have a conversation with the school nurse and the superintendent on a case-by-case -case basis, um, on a school-by-school -school basis, and we make our decisions that way. We don't have any type of metric, as Julia has so nicely laid out in any of the districts. Thank you. And I think um, to the second question, I think that group is just getting their feet off the ground. So um, I don't think they're, um, in speaking with Natalie, I don't think they're ready to roll out in force quite yet. Yes, but I guess my question was, um, was that was the fact that they may that we may have this additional support for which we're very thankful taken into account um, with these metrics. Dr. McCall, yeah. in this meeting, did you take that into account? Sure. So um, when we're thinking about this in the contact tracing, um, if you look at the the um, matrix itself, um, you know we're we're talking about. Um, other categories, really, um, it, it's not so much, yes, staffing, but when we're talking about staffing, it's not so much contact tracing as it is, okay, do we have enough staff to support a school? In a, you know, is a school nurse a close contact? Did, you know, do we have, um, you know, building administrators? Are we, you know, do we have, uh, you know, teachers who are out and we can't find uh, substitutes for? So that's really where that comes into play, Linda. Um, I know Brendan is working with this other group, and there will be more information, um, but it, it hasn't been defined yet. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move to Member Mills. Um, just so we can be really super transparent with families as they're thinking and, and staff when they're saying, okay, it's January 18th and are we, are we going to open tomorrow. Could you walk us through, if you could briefly, a tabletop exercise using today's data for how you would use this matrix um, to make what would ultimately be a binary decision. I know it's not like run red and you're red, but but how would you use it using today's data? So just kind of like if they were to pick in each yeah, category, like, where would we like be? To, like today is January 18th. How would you use this matrix to make the decision if we went back tomorrow using today's data? Dr. McCall, so where would we be right now? based on your matrices? And would you open schools so, tomorrow? So if we look at this um, and we have, because um, again, I think one of the things that you do is you look at the domains. So the various domains, available staff resources. Do we have enough staff resources uh, right now? Um, you know, I can tell you that our, we've had a large uptick in the number of staff who have been close contacts and or who have been um, COVID positive just over the past few, um, like I think two weeks, I believe. So that definitely played a role in how this is kind of happening. Um, but, you know, right now I would say, you know, we're looking at risk level one to two, somewhere in that, in, in that range, um, maybe a three in at least one of our schools. Um, available PPE, that's, that's a risk level one. We're very good with that because we really haven't had um, a lot of kids in school. Uh, state and regional healthcare resources, you know, again, I think that is one that I would defer back to the boards of health and say, hey, where are we with this right now? So I, um, so I'm actually saying to them, hey, where are we with this right now in terms of that surge capacity? Julia, Pat, so, where would you be right now in that capacity? Uh, matrices, green, yellow, red, somewhere in between. Yeah, for the hospital staff. Yeah. The hospital metric. Yeah, I I'd, I'd put us. Um, you know, in between a three and a four, in the four right now, probably closer to the four side, um, especially for the local or the um, more community hospitals, we are seeing that, you know, for instance, I believe um, one of the, the hospitals to the east of us required some um, ventilator supplies um, that, you know, they didn't have and, and had to be lent to them from Worcester already. We definitely are seeing um, 
that there is extensive um, use of surge capacity. There's a lot of staff that are being redeployed um, to handle things such as the DCU field hospital. And um, so I think, you know, you could put it probably solidly in a, in a four at this point. Thank you. And then uh, the last, I think, is the um, community. Uh, we well prior to that we had presence in multiple cases in the district. Yep. So if you if you look at that one, we do have um, we have multiple cases in the district. So um, you know we're probably in the yellow. If you look at the orange, that goes to when there's a suspected in school transmission beyond one cohort. So um, you know we're probably in the yellow there. And in terms of community positivity rate, um, I think as Julia said, Julia Pat, we're five percent and above. Yep. Just They're not a question. In. Okay, I can't see, sorry. <laughs> so then we would talk, with, so Ken, what we would then do is we'd go through this with the boards of health and um, you know, ask them where we're at in reference to the local community. Because again, the other thing that they do um, and they do it well is they're keeping track of these cases on a daily basis. So they'll, they'll go through and say, okay, actually, you know what, we, we just added another 75 cases today here in Holden or 52 cases in Rutland. Um, I think then it becomes a conversation at that stage of the game for, okay, where might we, where might we be, um, you know, at that time? So I don't, I, I'm not going to press member Mills question, but I know where he's going to go. So let's say go tomorrow, ahead, Megan. <laughs> tomorrow was January 19th. Would schools be open or closed based on today's data? Ken's nodding. He's like, yeah. I think, again, I talked to the boards of health about it and I have two members <laughs> from from the five towns so we, we would go out of, we got two out of five almost half so julia pat not to put you on the spot oh. i i just want to clarify i'm not a board of health member in worcester <laughs> i'm a staff member um so julia yeah. it's up to you Yep. So I, I think, you know, you have to kind of weigh it out, right? So um, imagine that all your risk factors are on a scale and where is the scale tipping? And in my mind, the scale is tipping that you would be either in response level three or response level four right now. All right. So they're telling you, Dr. McCall, you're in three to four, open or close the schools. So, wow, this is good. Good question. Uh, three to four. So yep. I think if we were in a three to four and, and you look down below all students remote except for cohort D, uh, we would actually probably be there right now. So we might not even open depending upon the numbers. Thank you. If, it were, no. if it were today. Is that an answer to your question, sir? I, I'm hearing none, so I'm assuming yeah, it's that's a it. Yeah, that's what I asked, yeah. Okay, thank you. Member Mitchell. Okay, uh, two, two questions. One, one is related to how is the administration looking at, you know, one, one I've dealt with this in more of a, in a business setting and, and our guidelines is if you're not feeling well or uh, you have a fever, you should not come to work. Now, I know the, the guidelines for in, uh, teachers and, and other employees are a little more stricter on what they can take off, what they can't. Um, so that that's question one is around that. And the second question is, it's really I, I, sh I don't want to say this. It's really easy to say, OK, we're moving from a hybrid to a remote session. But I believe that there is also some request for some time to go back. And is there, you know, this ping pong effect? Is there some hysteresis built into that? Meaning, OK, you know, if let's say we have to go remote. Is there some minimum time that that has to be done prior to us going back? Because if there is a delay relative to, um, say, the teachers need some extra time from once we've gone to remote to go back, as we're saying, these numbers it, are, are going to be constantly evolving. And I guess, you know, it's going to be a, it's going to be an interesting um, puzzle. So I just want to get the administration's input on that. Sure. So. Um... Ben, those are two good questions. Um, you know, in reference to the the time off and Director Carlson, if you're on the line, um, I know we've had several instances where people have had uh, COVID symptoms and so forth, and um, or they're COVID positive or they are um, uh, close contacts, and there's specific uh, legal 
rights that they have around their their COVID case. Jeff, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, actually, just to clarify, I'm I'm I'm, I'm talking about preventive, right? So I'm not as worried about the 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 hey, you have COVID, you have this. Again, one of the one of the great ways to prevent spread is saying I don't feel well. It could be a a headache, a, a slight fever, a, you know, any of the symptoms. I'm not going to come into a, a school to risk the community spread. That's that's a little different. That becomes subjective, and that's kind of what I'm what I'm trying to understand. What the administration's uh, stance on this? Okay, so, so I can, I can a- answer or help with this. Ben, sure, we have, we've told staff repeatedly. We have signs up in all the schools as well. If you if you feel sick, stay home, and that's what we've been repeating to people. This is. The last thing we want is the person who's starting to feel it. I can just, you know, push through this, and and meanwhile they're going, they're bringing in and they're infecting everybody else. So our motto right now through the pandemic is: if you feel sick, stay home. Sounds good. And then your second question, Ben. Yeah, the second question was related to, you know, you can if if it gets really bad and you get data in, you could almost make a call within a few days. Is there yeah. some amount of time before you can then flick that switch to say now everybody can come back in? Yeah, so I think that's one of the things. So it's it, to go from hybrid to remote, you can pretty much do it overnight. It's, um, you know, once you're kind of in that, that mode. Uh, to go from remote to high, from remote to hybrid, we want to give people time to, to get ready. So, you know, I, I think if we're talking about moving into that model, so let's just say we go into a model where we're, um, you know, we are in person hybrid, uh, we go to remote and then we know we're coming back. If we go back to remote in any situation, we're going to go back for, you know, probably either 10 to 14 days. I'm sorry. Yeah. 10 school days um, at, at most. And then we assess somewhere in there, before we come back or we make a decision. So it wouldn't be, hey, we're gonna close now for another three months. It's going to be done more more on a weekly to uh, two week basis. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Was it help member Mitchell? Yes. All right, great, thank you. Um, and thank you guys towards the end of the alphabet for your patience. We're gonna try to wrap this up quickly, but. So far, everybody has a unique question, which kind of speaks sometimes to the benefit of having a large school committee as all your minds put together really paint an, a really incredible picture. Uh, Member Otmar. So again, thank you to uh, Julia and Pat for joining us tonight. While a uh, school committee is the most fun four and a half hours most of us get to partake of Monday nights, it's uh, kind of a bonus for you guys. Um, my question is for administration. It actually really builds off of what uh, member Mills and then member Mitchell had stated. And so I was just wondering if you could kind of just talk a little bit more about kind of maybe even like what you, like how you see this, the use of this tool shaking out. Cause I guess, so like to lead into that come Thursday night, any person in the district with a calculator spreadsheets would be better, but can take a look at the state can refresh and take a look at the information on the state's, the state's weekly report, run the numbers and say, oh, according to the state's numbers for this week, Thursday night, Wachusett, our, our district's at 6%. All right, so that, that kind of, we can kind of see, see where that is. But is, I mean, would you foresee like, like having a routine like Thursday night kind of, kind of decision? Because that's kind of like a easily routine weekly decision where you can get everyone in the district gets an update on what that information is like. And everyone in the district can take a look at those same state reports and say, like, oh, this is this is where the hospitals are at. We can kind of get a gauge for that. Because it it seems like that would lead itself to an opportunity for so if we're talking about January 19th, then so the state like the report comes out on the seventh, numbers aren't that good. All right, we're still we're still got we still have the 19th on the wall, then the report comes out on the 14th, and we're not quite there yet. We're gonna like, are we going to delay a week or so? I well, maybe, so maybe I are, are you asking that. like what day of the week or when do you believe these should be updated? So I just want to get a clarification on, on the specific question. Yeah, so like, I'm asking if he can talk or if he foresees using this tool kind of like 
once a week checking everything yep. to like is it checking it on monday for the following monday or so like sure. because some of these are, some question. of these we get like at different times so. so so dr mccall like when like in the course of a week would you foresee using this matrices sitting down and really looking at it so um as carl said the state comes out with their numbers on thursday evening um around five or six o'clock uh, again, you know, one of the things that we could do is take a look at those numbers, um, put them in with some other information, because the other part of it is when I'm talking about the the hospital surge, when I'm talking about um, some of the other information in here, um, we have some of it. I guess we could put something together. But it, you know, the other thing I just want to point out to people is other districts really aren't doing it quite to this detail. Um, and it's partly due to the fact that there is so much change that goes on. I think, Carl, I hear exactly what you're saying about saying, okay, there's a specific time that we set aside and say, okay, let's make the determination as to whether or not we move forward or not. You know, at that time, I, I agree. I think that would make life a lot easier for people in terms of planning and so forth. Um, I just don't know whether or not it's completely feasible based upon, you know, the information that we would have at hand. Julia and Pat, like in terms of the the hospital numbers, I, I you know again that's information that I get from the boards of health in terms of talking with them about where people are at and you know you know UMass and so forth. Is that something that could be, I guess, shared on a weekly basis? Yeah, I think we could get that information on a weekly basis. We you know we receive some of it from the Department of Public Health directly. It's it's publicly available. Anybody could access it. Um, and then some of it, um, you know, we receive through speaking with other um, health boards and, and being in touch with the hospitals directly. So, um, but I, I don't anticipate that we would have a problem providing that information on a weekly basis if, if you wanted it. So, um, yeah, how about this? We, we will take a look to see how that might be able to happen on a Friday um, okay. after that Thursday. But um, yeah, we'll definitely take that into consideration. Thank you, Dr. McCall, and I think uh, we'd follow up on that request. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, just add a minute. Whatever makes sense, sense, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Member Otmar. That was a great question. Um, Member Cantos, any, anything to add? Yes. Uh, th thank you to both uh, guests who are with us tonight, Julie and Patricia, for your time. I'd like to make one comment uh, for everyone and then uh, I have some questions for Julia. Uh, the comment would be, I'd like to put emphasis on the fact that this matrix is, is supposed to be used on, or have the ability to be used on any level. Uh, it specifically states that it can be used on a level from classroom to school, to town, to district. It, this isn't a close the whole district because of one town kind of deal. This can be uh, managed in subset. Uh, my question for Julia is specifically about the data. I was just curious uh, what these percentages uh, that are released, what time frame are they calculated over, like a day, a week, and how fast are those, uh, like for our specific towns, for example, the positivity rates, how fast are they shared from the sources, instantly, daily, weekly? So the percentages that we receive, we receive them generally on Wednesday evening for the data release that goes out on Thursday. Um, and the state provides us with the total number of tests that were conducted in, um, in the town, as well as the number of positive tests that came out of that, which is what yields our percent positivity. So that information is given to us weekly, but it accomplishes or it encompasses um, two weeks worth of data. So. When we receive that data, so say I receive data um, on Wednesday the 23rd, that data is gonna be good for the time period starting on December 6th through December 19th. So it's a two week rolling um, percentage. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Member Pantos. Uh, Member Shapiro. Um, things about being so far in the uh, Alphabet is that the other members really covered a lot of, the, a lot of my questions. Um, Member Mills' exercise was very useful, and that's what I was looking for, was something like that. So thank you, and I'm all set with my questions. Awesome. Thank you, and thank you for your patience. Um, Member Smith, to you. 
Um, I don't have any questions. I just want to thank Julia and Pat for attending tonight. And thank you, committee members, for all of your questions. They've been really awesome tonight. Member Sullivan, you got something awesome? That's tough to follow up. No, I, a lot of my questions were, were operational as well, just as far as in practice how, uh, you know, thresholds and, and timelines. And I think a lot of them were uh, answered. I guess my only question would be to follow up that would be, as we pivot, if we were to pivot, if we were to go back on the 19th and have to pivot, what does that communication look like as far as to families, but also does that need our official approval? Is it more of a conversation? We certainly don't need to, I don't imagine we'd meet each time. Just, uh, I guess, ask those questions that I could. So mostly communication to us, but also to families and and, um, and so forth. That is an awesome question. Yeah, that is, that's an excellent question. So, um, so just to, kind of go through that. Um, communication would go through a school messenger. Uh, that's how it would typically work. Um, if we're going to think about doing a wholesale um, close of the district for two weeks, it would be something where I'd want to at least attempt to kind of get school committee together in some form or fashion to go through it real quick with them. Um, it's a little different versus closing a, a building or a classroom or something like that. Uh, there have been many examples of schools that have closed because of staffing issues, uh, because of parties on a weekend, um, and they, you know, they closed the high school out of uh, caution um, for the next, you know, week or two. So again, that's something that would be, you know, we would do, you know, and then moving forward, we'd also talk directly with DESE. I talked to Rob Curtin, the associate um, commissioner or directly to the commissioner and go through the process with them as well. Thank you both very much. Um, Member Williamson. Um, I, I just appreciate having a, a matrix that is so detailed like this. Um, everybody had really great questions and it's been great conversation. Uh, I am all set. Thank you. Uh, Member Woodland. Um, yes, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Julia and Pat, for um, being here tonight, putting this together with the district. Um, it's been incredible to have something written, physical to look at and to focus our discussion on. Um, most of my one question got answered. I just have one comment about uh, going back to the contact tracing question that one member had earlier. Um, in facilities last week, we were told that one positive case usually brings about 60 minutes to 90 minutes of work uh, by district staff. Um, so that was just something I we had a number put to last week, so I thought I would share it. But that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then last but certainly not least, Member Young. Um, yeah, I think just about everything's been covered. Um, I do want to build on uh, Linda's comment um the one we discussed it at facilities and security last week um one of the comments was um not just the time it takes um but the actual personnel that are used right now um usually it's um deputy barlow and uh, director keenan are involved in every single contact tracing um so every time there's one it pulls them out of anything they're doing for an hour immediately um along with the school personnel that are involved. Um, so, you know, it, we discussed it and as we move forward, we, we need to find a way to streamline that a little bit because we're going to see more cases and it's going to be, you know, we can't have that be our deputy superintendent's full-time job. Um, you know, unfortunately, that's where we are right now. Um, my, my only comment, and, you know, thanks everyone for being here, Julia, Pat, it's great. Um, you know, to build on um, Member Otmar's question about having it, you know, setting up at least once a week to update the schedule and building on Malaya's comment to put it on the uh, dashboard. Um, if we could put that link on the dashboard with a date of when it was updated, because ideally it could be updated, you know, whenever new information is available and at a minimum of every week, I think would be a good, a good starting place. Um, so that people can look and go, oh, yep, it was updated two days ago. I looked at it yesterday, I'm good. Um, so then we just have a record of every single time it's updated. Um, that's my only comment, so thank you. 
Thank you, Member Young, and thank you to Julia and Pat. You're welcome to stay for the remainder of our conversation this evening um, or hop off. But again, thank you so much for taking your time um, and always for being such an assistance to our, our community. So hats off to you guys. Next in our agenda tonight, there's a motion um, that students in grades K, one, two, three, grade three in Glenwood only, six, five in Sterling, nine and 12, shall return to school no later than January 5th, 2021. The return to school shall be contingent on meeting the specific health metrics established by the district based on advice of Member Town's local board of health and approved by the school committee by December 21st, 2020. Is there a motion on the floor? Seeing none, we're gonna move on to the next item of uh, on our agenda this evening. Motion to direct district administration to ensure and provide at least six feet of physical distancing for students and staff. Is there a motion on the floor for this? Can I, I'm, I'll make the motion. Is there a second? Second. This has been moved and seconded. Um, can the administration uh, provide um, some guidance on this? Dr. I'm McCall, sorry. Yeah, so, I, I know it's rough for you, you said administration. I was having a hard time hearing you. <laughs> yeah. So um, I guess uh, it's okay. So guidance, i.e., where where are we in reference to six foot? Yeah, distancing? yeah, I, yeah. We had the report. So where do we stand no. in regards of the six foot distancing? Sure. So, uh, Deputy Berlone, I've been going through this uh, over the past, you know, several weeks. Um, one of the things that we have shared, and we shared this, um, Bob was at um, Facilities and Security uh, last week and talked about um, the high school in particular. So, at the high school, we have many, many classrooms uh, where we are within six feet. We're not at six feet, but we're also, you know, we might not be at three feet. We might be at four and a half feet. We might be at five feet. It might be five and a half. Uh, but there are many classrooms where we are unable to um, actually be uh, within that six foot confine, which is one of the reasons why DESE um, made the three foot to six foot um, kind of regulation. Uh, in reference to some of the other sp classrooms or schools, we do have a few other schools. Um, I think Davis Hill has a couple of classrooms, Central Tree a couple of classrooms, um, and also Glenwood. And part that's partly due to the fact that we have some cohorts that were not equally distributed. And that's primarily because of uh, transportation uh, where kids maybe lives or requests um, to be in one cohort over another. So we're looking at that as well. But, you know, in all honesty, the, the number one school that is most concerning with this, you know, particular regulation or, or um, request is the high school. And Bob, did you have anything to add to that? No, we certainly took, the, as a school committee, everybody talked about the importance of six feet and trying to meet that. And we took that as marching orders when we set up all of the schools. And we are doing our best to meet that uh, we're, as we work out minor problems. We're like transportation, the size of each cohort. We're looking to try to address that as best we can in the schools. But at this point in time, those um, four schools that Daryl mentioned, we can't guarantee that every classroom for each cohort would be at six feet of distance. Megan, I was the maker of the motion. Can I speak about the motion? Absolutely. And I think I remember Lavoie asked you, I'm assuming this might be a shorter question list. I'm going to try to use um, the chat for, for this motion. So uh, Member Smith, you may go first and then Member Lavoie. As one of the main ways to mitigate the risk associated with in-person learning, the CDC guidelines call for the six feet of physical distancing. The Massachusetts Department of Public Health guidelines also state that six feet or more of distancing is the best course of action to mitigate the risk of transmission of COVID. While I understand that the DESE's initial school reopening guidance states three to six feet of distancing as the goal for in-person learning, Currently, distances under six feet are contrary to current public health guidelines on physical distancing. 
it's my understanding that in our high school, it's just as was just mentioned, that 15 to 20 percent of classrooms are currently not scheduled as to accommodate the six feet of distancing. In our high school and all of our schools, there will be prolonged exposure where not all students, teachers, and staff will be wearing their masks with fidelity despite their best efforts. Without peer-reviewed medical data about schools who have implemented in-person learning with less than six feet of distancing, our district is taking an unnecessary risk and might be contributing to the potential transmission of this disease in our communities. If some of you are not swayed by what I see as a moral obligation not to put others at unnecessary risk for a disease, then the economic and operational factors may be more persuasive. The CDC guidelines for determining a close contact state that an individual who's been within six feet of an infected person for a period of 15 minutes over a 24 hour period will be considered one of a, will be considered a close contact and need to quarantine. All of our contact in classrooms will exceed this 15 minute cumulative time frame. If we have classrooms that are not conducive to maintaining that six feet, of distance and faculty, staff, and students are exposed to an infected person, we may not be able to staff our schools and keep them open for in-person learning, and we've seen that this week at the ECC. I ask that you support the motion to direct district administration to ensure and provide at least six feet of physical distancing for students and staff. Thank you. Thank you, Member Smith. Um, Member LaVoy, please. Yeah, I have allowing Member Smith to speak uh, because I had a question about the, the motion itself. But this so, and I don't know if Member Smith is the, the one to answer this or if it's administration. I can fully support this motion, but I, I don't support the motion is because there is one building that cannot accommodate that we don't look at opening up other buildings. So I'm not really sure what the output of the, the motion is from administration. And I, I just kind of offer one set of guidance that I've heard that gym classes sometimes are not happening now because areas like that are being used for storage of desks and, and things like that. And I would just ask that if that's the case and there are opportunities to find capacity for six foot social distancing, that that might be an output of it. But my first question kind of remains for the maker of the motion. What's the, what's the output of this? Because I think administration is doing their best to find succeed in, in all the areas from what I'm hearing from them. Do you mind if I, I go to Member Smith first and then to the administration so they can both answer, Matt? Is that okay? That's perfectly fine. All right, thank you. So Member Smith. So you're, so the question is really asking what am, what am I looking for? Well, like what's the outcome if, if the administration says they can't find six feet, then what? I, I mean, honestly, I think that's unacceptable because we have to find six feet. I, that's my that's my wish, desire. I think that should be all of our desire. There has to be a way. Member Lavoie just mentioned one possible way. If we're not serving lunch, then classes could be in cafeteria spaces. I don't know. I'm not in the school. I haven't been giving schematics of the classrooms. Um, I also had asked previously that the administration give the cl actual classrooms that this would affect so parents would know if their children, it's part of making the informed decision. If I find out that five of my child's classrooms will be at three feet of distance, I might make a different choice and send them to school. Um, so it's about information. It's about doing our best in, and maybe we have to arrange some of the cohort, cohort um, configurations. I don't know, but this has been an ongoing issue that we have brought up for months um, and there's always a solution. Thank you. Uh, Dr. McCall, so so if this motion were to pass tonight, I think this comes to Member Lavoie's point, what, if anything, could be done to make sure that it, it is adhered to? So, um, Member Lavoie mentioned um, most of the school, like what other schools are doing. So, for example, um, I was at Glenwood the other day and basically um, about a third of the gymnasium is being used as extra cafeteria space because they can't fit everyone they need into the full cast because it's just too small for the distancing. Um, you know, when we're talking about the high school, the high school's already using their cafeteria in terms of that being um, you know, a, basically a study hall. It's, it's where, you know, again, all the kids would go who would typically be in um, a different study hall in, you know, one of the different classrooms. So when we're, you know, again, I think 
when we're talking about how this might play out, I think uh, Christina mentioned this, you know, it might be that we would have to modify the cohort model at the high school so that rather than having uh, A, B, and C be remote, it might be A, B, C, and a D remote, and then an E for the, um, you know, our, our media students. So we might actually have to have three rotating um, models where we have, um, you know, two days, two days, two days, and then they would start anew for a, a six-day rotation. That would be one of the ways to get around the, um, the issues that we're having at the high school. But I can tell you, the classrooms are small at the high school. That's one of the issues. Uh, it's a renovated building. They were, <clears throat> the, um, the newer classrooms are, you know, okay. But, um, you know, again, it's, it's going to be a challenge for us to do this. And um, Bob, anything to add, you know, in reference to uh, that school or any of the other schools? Yeah, I just wanted to comment uh, uh, to sort of touch on what Matt mentioned. Our principals are really doing whatever they can in there. Like, for instance, in Central Tree, I know half the gymnasium is being used for storage of furniture that came out of the classrooms in order so that we could increase the space to get uh, the, as many kids in those classrooms as possible. It could be that uh, I, I'm not quite sure what we would do in some cases. Daryl did mention that we would go to from a two cohort model, an A and a B, to a three cohort model, uh, or a four cohort model if, if three doesn't quite work. So that means only a quarter or a third of the kids would be in at a time, which means that uh, for the high school students, they'd be getting uh, two days of in-person instruction and then, uh, for instance, four days off or, or some, some uh, you know, part like that. Um, in terms of the other schools, some of the problems we're having is simply not just moving kids from one cohort to another because some parents have already requested the kids be put into a certain cohort and uh, that's created some smaller problems like it in a 20 person classroom it's not 10 in one cohort and 10 in the other it's more like 13 in one and seven in the other those types of things and then the impact on terms of transportation isn't simply to find some kids to put back in there it's okay the kids that are on that bus run is there room in the cohort b run for three more kids to be on that bus so those are some of the challenges that we have with this it's not a simple fix and i and we are doing everything that we, we can to try to make this work thank you, thank you Thank you to the administration for those answers. I do have a number of school committee members um, with their hands up. Christina, can you go back to being my timer if you don't mind? Sure. Got, yes, two minutes. Got it. Got it. Um, member Long Belia, please. Yes. I'm wondering if it's worth at this point. And, and well, my question is um, when you're estimating the number of kids who may be back in school, are you taking into account that some families will, uh, that more families will choose remote now than would have chosen it when we initially asked um, because either because of concerns of the virus or because they've become accustomed to the remote and they're comfortable enough with it that they want to stay that way? Um, so like how many, are you asking like how many kids would have to switch to remote to make this work? Well, no, no, no. Well, kind of. Yeah, I guess yeah. kind of. Yes. But I guess that's one way to put it. That's not exactly where I was going, but close enough. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> yeah. So there's there's really, you know, I can't necessarily estimate how many families will make a decision to move from hybrid and just stay remote. Um, that's that's it's kind of playing with fire because if we make that estimation and then we're dependent upon that and then it doesn't happen, um, mm -hmm. then we're in trouble. So, uh, mm -hmm. again, you know, we try to stick with hard, fast numbers as much as humanly possible. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when we're talking about classes and buses and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it would be challenging to do, Linda. I, I, I understand that. And I'm wondering if it would make sense. I don't know if this is appropriate in this discussion or not. Um, to to suggest that um, that we that we that we um, do another survey of families to see what the numbers are, um, because they may have changed at this point. So, um, 
I'm trying to think if I want to amend the motion on the floor. I don't know if that really fits in with this motion. No, I think, but I think, I think it would be more of a request for information um, okay. for another survey or, or just a, a request to reach out to parents before the 19th. Yes, that's, yes, that would be my, I, I request that uh, p piece of information. Okay. <laughs> from I'll, the put in, I'll put that in writing for you this evening, Linda. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Linda. And you know what, I, I can tell you that was something that we were already, you know, thinking about. This is, and again, just so you know, this has been an ongoing process. This is, you know, we we have not, people have still made modifications to cohorts as, it, as they've made decisions. So um, we've been very, very flexible in, in that sense. So um, we've been doing everything in our power to uh, help families um, as best we can. Um, around daycare issues, around um, transportation issues. So um, we could put something out there. Um, and I was planning on doing something pr well, well prior to the 19th, but right after right after the New Year's. Yeah, I think that that's a better plan. Right after the New Year would be better. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you for Thank the you. suggestion, Linda. Uh, oh, and you know, excuse me. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, Chair Weeks. Um, Barry Sklar did want to just, quickly jump in real quick on this, sure. if you don't mind. Uh, yes, I just wanted to point out that we've been working with the bus company um, and the routes, the, the route planning for these cohorts is extremely complex and they just sent us today the updated bus routes based to reflect the most recent changes that parents have requested in power school. Every time we make changes to the cohorts, the buses have to be completely redone. So if you want to send a survey out to parents and recast all that stuff, I don't know that we can be back in school on the 19th. Good point, Barry. Thank you. All right, let's think about that. Um, let's get through a few more hands, guys. Um, and then we do have more motions on the agenda tonight. So, uh, Member Young. Thanks. So, this, yeah, we did discuss this quite a bit at facilities and security last week. Um, one thing that was emphasized is you know, that currently there's no classrooms in the district that are facing. Um, you know, all of it is more than that. You know, I think worst case, we're looking around four and a half feet. Um, you know, and also it was emphasized that there's no mass breaks or anything like that in any space where it's less than six feet. Um, you know, and, and we've heard that, you know, passing this is a huge impact um, on every aspect of opening the school. So I can't necessarily support the motion as it is, um, but if this motion does fail, I would like to officially request uh, that the administration provides what the current minimum spacing is in each school and you know the number of classrooms that it impacts in each school. Um, so that people can make that in the decision. Because I mean, I think that's the key point, you know, that we're doing our best to get that six feet. There's going to be some that are, you know, four and a half, five, half feet. And, you know, put that information out there and let people make that decision. Um, Thank you. Memory, you know, I mean, that is a great decision. Um, the people that we are, you know, that are our, our teachers and stuff, it's six feet from the students everywhere, even in the classrooms where it's under five students. Um, so, you know, Thank you, Adam. And, th and that is a great suggestion. If the motion does fail, I will request that formally to the administration. Um, Member Ayala? Um, I have a question. Um, just curious. I don't even know if there's an answer, but um, are most schools that are already in hybrid model providing the six feet more of distance or a lot of them are they not able to meet that inner six feet and under? I'm just asking this because our BOH mentioned that there's not a lot of in-school transmission going on from what they, from the data that they have. So I'm just wondering if a lot of the schools that are in prove that the six feet of distance is working, if, if they can meet that criteria. I just, I'm just curious how other schools are making it work. I mean, I know I went to the city of Worcester schools and those classrooms were so squished and I can't imagine like, I know they're not in right now, but I can't imagine them trying to make it work. 
for six so, weeks. Yeah, I, can, I can ask the um, superintendent if, through his listserv if, if he's heard. Um, Dr. McCall, through your listserv, have you heard of uh, schools making these decisions? <laughs> And again, this was something that was maybe discussed back in August, September, a little bit more than than right now. Um, it's it's it would only be anec anecdotal at this stage of the game, and it's primarily it's it's like a fifty fifty split because you are going to have some some there are some schools that have said six or some districts that have said okay, it's a six foot minimum and that's it. We're we're going to work around it however we need to do it, and that's what they've done. Um, then there are other districts that have said, we, you know, we physically can't do that if we want to be able to open up. So they've modified the um, the spacing. And again, I believe that's probably one of the reasons why Desi did that in the first place was because they knew they were going to run into this issue in many districts. And you gave a great example of Worcester uh, because they are uh, those classrooms and many of those buildings um, um, are, are going to be very cramped. Yeah. Thank you. So I think there's no there's no perfect number right now but I, I anecdotally from my experiences i know districts are all over the place on this and just one quick thing if we if, if we were to vote this motion through what happens with i think matt might have mentioned this but i didn't really hear like an answer what would happen if we voted that for this this if we can't do six feet in the high school or whatever school if we can't do it do we just not open that school I think Dr. McCall mentioned that there would just be three cohorts now and you would go on a six day rotation. So we, would right. we, yeah, wouldn't, we wouldn't just close out a school because no, fewer days in school. Okay. Few, right. There would be fewer in person days and there would be more remote days. Member Woodland. Okay. Um, so I have a, a couple questions here. Um, actually, no, they, many were answered, sorry. Um, so a question that I have is if this would apply to buses, um, because one thing that we talked about in facilities last week is that on buses, it's three feet of distances between kids. I know in Sterling in the before times, um, my kids were on the bus roughly 40 minutes on the way to school and about 35 minutes on the way home. So if that's a lot, that's a lot of time to be three feet apart um, from other students. So if we were to pass this, would this apply to buses? Um, and um, kind of a corollary to that is do, do does Wachusett have um, ways to video monitor to see for those close contacts? like um, I think it was Pat who had mentioned in other districts. And yeah, so, um, one so question oh, the buses. Go ahead and answer and I'll. Okay, so uh, for the first one, uh, typically no, those, it, it wouldn't be a six foot distance on a bus. Um, that wouldn't be what they would, they would be, you know, what we would use because again, I think that would not permit Students, to, you'd have to move every other. So if you were in a row, you'd have to sit every other seat in, in that row. So you'd cut it down, you know, basically in half again. So um, that wouldn't work. Um, but I can tell you that the buses through AA, they do have um, videos on them already or cameras. Um, and then my only follow up to that is, it's directly related. Um, mm -hmm. Have parents been, uh, I don't recall from the transportation survey from um, a while back when we chose hybrid versus remote only. Um, mm -hmm. what, was that clearly spelled out that our students would be three feet apart on the bus? Um, and the same for um, if we, if this motion does not pass, uh, I would second that idea that we need to notify parents and the students themselves about any time that they would be under six feet from um, other people. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So, you know, Linda, I didn't say, I do not believe any of the information that went out to anybody talked about the distancing on buses. buses. Um, I know, you know, I literally took the slides directly from Desi that had the um, diagrams associated with, with the buses and where kids would sit um, based upon that. Um, but I don't think there was anything that said, okay, it's going to be three feet or five feet or six feet. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, again, I think we could definitely provide that other information for everyone. Thank you, Dr. McCall. 
Uh, we do have three more people with their hands. Again, um, you guys have done a great job asking new questions tonight, but let's just make sure we continue to do so. Member Pantos. Uh, so I do have several questions for administration. The first being, um, so as I can remember it not many years ago, being on a bus, uh, the seat basically divide people um, if they're the proper height, depending on the make and model of the bus and how it's outfitted. Does that serve as a divider? Or is that null and void as far as being a uh, divider? So uh, we do have the taller seats on our buses. So they're not the low seats like when probably most of us went to school. They're actually up another five to eight inches. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily serve as a divider. Um, but, you know, kids are still going to be wearing masks. The other thing that um, people need to realize is windows are going to be open on the buses at all times. So unless it's the dead of winter and it's 20 degrees below zero, um, you know, windows are going to be cracked an inch because one of the things that we've talked about is just airflow um, through a vehicle like a bus. And it's pretty easy once you open some windows and you crack the um, ventilation on the top of the bus to move air through uh, in a way that y you're not even going to see in a building. So um, that's one of the mitigating factors that needs to be taken into account. Okay. Um, my other question is being, so I think we can all agree that uh, the lower grades are definitely a high priority to get back in the schools uh, for mental and emotional health. And I was wondering, so is it just the high school that we're having a problem with six feet at? If that were the case, can we just delay the opening of the high school until something is worked out? And what, if any classrooms in what schools could you list uh, need to don't acquire, don't have the six foot distancing as it stands right now. Because if it's just the high school, we can do it. I think you mentioned three other elementary schools, right? Yeah, we did. So, um, and again, I don't have the specifics about which room um, it, it is because, as I think Deputy Berlow mentioned, because we've had cohorts move, like change in terms of the numbers. Um, based, it, you know, we can't just split a class in half. It's not 12 and 12. If it's a class of 24, um, it might be, you know, unfortunately six and 18. So, um, fitting those 18 kids into a space is something that they're currently looking at. So even if it was something that we knew four weeks ago, okay, this particular space is going to be fine. It might not be right now. So that's what we're looking at is how we can ensure that those spaces are okay. I can tell you the high school, um, it is going to be a challenge to say the least. And I think the really the only way that we might be able to get around it is by moving into uh, or adding an extra cohort um, to that group. Would that be your final answer for the only way to get around it at this time? At the high school? Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your questions, Member Pantos. Um, let's see, Member Gustafson. So some of my questions have been asked, so thank you all. Um, I have a comment and a question. Um, I think there, even though it's under six feet, I think there is a very big difference between five feet, five inches or five feet, eight inches and three feet. And I, I think having, I wish we had that data because it had been requested before. So that would be super helpful to know. Um, I'd like to hope that most of our classrooms are, are closer to six feet than three feet. Um, but I think there's a big difference. Um, I mean, statistically, I know contact tracing wise, there's not, but in terms of safety, I think it, it is helpful to know. Um, my second question is something you brought up about the ideas of the cohorts and how they're divided. And while I am sympathetic to our families, I do have an observation that in normal times, um, I know, for example, with bus routes, families are told we can't have our kids get off at any other stop because that's how the buses are made. There is a limit to how many kids can fit on each route and it's very disruptive and we have rules that prohibit kids from getting off at daycare stops or different stops on certain days of the week because it's very disruptive. Um, so I guess I'm somewhat curious how this decision to allow parents to request specific cohorts is different than that. Um, because it sounds like it's having a safety impact. Um, I know it might be more convenient and we would try to accommodate it if we can, just as we try to accommodate students switching models or, um, or other things, but we don't allow families to get off at other buses in normal times. We don't allow families to request their teachers because it's more convenient for whatever thank, reason. Thank you, that's um, so that's my question. question. Thank you. So, um, so the switching a cohort. Yeah. 
so uh, again, so we're we're not allowing students to uh, switch buses right now. Uh, again, they're getting picked up at their home and they're getting dropped off at their home. So, yeah, I think she's asking they, about how did we get to the switching of cohorts? Is that to keep siblings in the same cohort or were there other reasons? Right. I, I don't think it's siblings. I think it's because- uh, let's, let's, let's let them answer. So let's let them that answer. was my question. So, so part of it is that because they're divided by alphabet, so mm -hmm. family members in other schools are in the same cohort. So when we're looking at this, they're trying to align, you know, I have a student at, or, a, you know, kids at Naquag. I have a second grader at Naquag. I have a fourth grader at Glenwood. And I have a seventh grader at Central Tree. And families are trying to align those. And that's what we're mm -hmm. ending up looking at. Okay. Thank you. It makes sense if it's alphabetical. If it's due to other reasons, I would raise that as a concern and suggest that yep. perhaps they should concern. trump that. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Member Otmar, again, uh, this discussion is starting to drag on a bit, so so new and interesting. Just, 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 just a quick question. Just, I mean, I just want to be clear that parents can still like change their mind about which mode they want to do. So, like, say an example, I find out that I'm, I'm I got my kids signed up for hybrid. I find out that in their classroom, it's five foot three, and I'm like, eh, maybe I'm not quite that comfortable so, with it. So I, I want to change my mind. Can, I still do that? Can, we still, can we still switch? Yeah, if we have to, yes. Yes. And I understand hybrid to remote's different. There's different logistics from remote to hybrid, but more hybrid changing to remote. Yes. yes. Hybrid to remote is um, very easy. Thank you. Thank you. Member Dennis, please. Thank you. So, you know, I'll offer my perspective. Um, you know, air ventilation is a mitigation. Um, mask wearing is a mitigation and social distancing is a mitigation. And I think we can all appreciate that six feet is better than five feet, but it's better than four feet. But what I think what you know we heard is the impact of this motion um, is not that the administration is going to find more creative space. It's that there's going to be less school. Um, and you know, I, I think I, I, I could not get behind uh, this motion um, the way that it's written. Uh, if it were to say that we want to ensure that we have six feet wherever possible, because I think that that's a standard that we want to aspire to and achieve, I can absolutely get behind that. But to uh, decrement or, or go down in the amount of school because we're going from six feet to five feet to four feet um, while we're doing all of these other things to provide safeguards, um, I, I think would be a poor trade off. Thank you. Thank you, Member Dennis. Um, I have Member Brown, please. Yeah, I agree with uh, Member Dennis. Um, one of the concerns a lot of parents have by going to hybrid is less education, uh, the time transporting kids, the two cohorts. If we go to three cohorts, imagine the strain that would put on the system. And I would like to call the motion. Okay, Member Brown has called the question. This motion is not debatable, but it does need a second. I second. Okay. It's been made and seconded. So the vote right now is to call the question, not on the motion. Member Ayala. Where'd you go, Melissa? Sorry, I had to find the mute. Um, and D. Yeah. Uh, call the question, not on the motion. To call the question, um, I'm going to say no. Okay. Member Bennett? Bennett, no. Member Brown? Brown, yes. Member Dennis? Dennis, yes. Member Gustafson? Yes. Member Haber? Yes. Member Inberg? Yes. Member Kirschenbaum? Yes. Member Lavoie? Yes. Member Longville? Yes. Member Mills? Yes. Member Mitchell? Mitchell, yes. Member Otmar? Otmar, yes. Member Pantos? So is this the closed debate? Correct. Question? Yes. Member Shapiro? Shapiro, yes. Member Aristotle has left us? Member Smith? Smith, yes. Member Sullivan? Yes. Member Williamson? Williamson, yes. Member Woodland? Woodland, yes. Yeah. Member Young? Young, yes. Chair votes yes, motion passes. So now on the floor is the motion, which states for you guys again, give me one second, read it to you. 
Students in grades one, two, three, grade three is Glenwood only, six, five in Sterling, nine in, oh my gosh, I am <laughs> it. Um, Motion to direct staff, district administration to ensure and provide at least six feet of physical distancing distancing for students and staff. So that is the motion It has been called. We're gonna go through a roll call vote while I sit here embarrassed for a moment. Member Ayala. It's okay, Megan, don't worry about it. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna vote yes. Okay, Member Bennett. Bennett, yes. Member Brown. Brown, no. Member Dennis. Dennis, no. Member Gustafson. No. Member Haber. Haber, no. Member Imber. Imber, no. Member Kirschenbaum. Kirschenbaum, no. Member Lavoy. Lavoy, no. Member Long Belial? No. Member Mills? Mills, no. Member Mitchell? Mitchell, no. Member Altmar? Altmar, no. Member Pantos? Pantos, no. Member Shapiro? Shapiro, yes. Member Smith? Smith, yes. Member Sullivan? Sullivan, no. Member Williamson? Williamson, no. Member Woodland? Woodland, yes. Yeah. Member Young? Young, no. The chair abstains and the motion fails. Next on our agenda tonight is a review of parent, guardian, remote learning survey data. Is this a presentation from the administration or something you guys would like to speak to? Uh, oh, yes, it's probably going to be a presentation. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to ask Brendan and Bob to pull it up for me if possible. I'm sure they will oblige. I'll pull it up right now. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Brendan. Feel like you're gonna have an angry conversation with your internet provider tomorrow, Dr. McCall. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is this is crazy. You should move to Princeton, where the internet's great. It is, isn't it? <laughs> Bob, I never thought I'd hear those words out of your mouth. The the internet in Princeton is great. It is. It's, uh, it's, it's a dream. It's up now, Dr. McCall. When you're ready. Okay. Thank you. So. Uh, I, Again, this is uh, these are the survey results in reference to a survey that we shared with families um, the week of December 2nd through the 6th. We had over 3,000 respondents, and um, we asked a couple of questions. So, Brendan, do you want to start moving to the next one? Are you on slide two? Okay. Are you there? Sorry, I can't unmute my mic without... Uh coming out of the presentation, but yes, we are on. I'll, I'll okay. Yep, so he's on too. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, slide, first slide, remote learning effectiveness. This, these are all grades. So again, uh, we did this through grade 12. So understanding that remote instruction can't fully replicate the experience of in-person schooling, how effective has the remote learning model been in educating your child in quarter one? So we looked specifically at quarter one. So out of the 3,071 responses, we had Almost 20% say very effective. We had almost 40% say adequately effective. We had a little over 29% say somewhat effective. And then we had 12.7% say not effective. And this is, uh, again, these are all grades um, pulled together. So Brendan, if you can move to the next one. All set. You're all set. Thank you. Uh, the next one, remote learning effectiveness, uh, pre-K grade two. So it's the same question. Uh, again, we have 21.5% very effective, 36.8% adequately effective, um, somewhat effective, uh, 28.6, and then not effective, 13.2. Uh, again, that number is a little higher than um, the overall uh, numbers for all of the grades. And, you know, primarily, you know, you know, as we've been talking about this, it, it might be because we have uh, the students have a little more of a challenging time at the younger levels. On the next slide. Right there. Go ahead. Okay. Grade three through five. Um, again, <clears throat> this had the most positive responses in terms of or the largest percentage over very effective and adequately effective. So close to 40% for adequately and a little over 23% for very effective. Um, and again, 
25%, um, almost 26% for somewhat effective and 11.5% for not effective. On the next slide, grades um, six through eight, uh, we have, um, again, very effective, adequately effective, um, you know, a little over 50%. And then we have um, a large portion that is in the somewhat effective, uh, 32%, and then 13.8% for um, not effective. At the high school level, 9 through 12. We had 42% say adequately effective, 16% very effective. Somewhat effective was um, almost 30% and not effective was 12.4%. Uh, so the next one is on structured learning time, all grades. So how would you describe your child's structured learning time in quarter one? So out of all respondents, we had close to 60% say about right. We had 7.6% say it should be decreased. We had another almost 25% say the time should be increased and then 10% uh, was other. And if we break it down by grade levels for pre-K through two, um, again, you can see those numbers about 58% about right um, <clears throat> should be increased 23.5% uh, should be decreased 7.1% and 11.7 for other. And you, you'll note that these numbers are very similar as you go through the grades. Uh, in grades three through five, 61.6% .6 say that it's about right. Um, let's see, 25.5% say it should be increased. 5% say it should be decreased. And then uh, we have 7.9% for other. In grades six through eight, 52.6% .6 was about right. 9.1% uh, should be decreased almost, well, a little over 28% should be increased, and then almost 10% for other. And then at the high school level, um, again, almost 60% about right, um, a little under, a little over 9% should be decreased, 22.5% uh, should be increased, and then 9.4% for other. So takeaways from this, and these are really the next steps that we've been talking about, so principals are developing intervention plans for um, the students who are having a, a, you know more of a challenging time associated with um, some of the some of the remote learning that we've been working on. So they're looking at developing um, more individual individualized support from teachers and support staff such as counselors. Um, you know they have set up times to meet with individual students and parents to help support them where needed, how they can better support them at home and through uh, the school. Schools are preparing for additional Group D students to come for in-person learning, which is a, uh, an important part of kind of making that next step. And, you know, the areas of focus, and this is something that all schools have um, done um, at, the, at the school level, and we can see it at the district level. So we have um, non-attendance, low performance on assessments, which is really academics, social emotional support. And then, and then also re-engaging students in school. So um, again, you have students who are missing school um, because of they're not attending or students who are just totally not engaging. And that's what we're, you know, con you know mostly concerned about. And then for K-8 students, developing students uh, specific intervention plans based upon grade level reading and math assessments. And that's our STAR math program and our STAR reading program. And those are ones that we just purchased this year. Um, for us to, um, you know, really utilize and develop better assessments on. Um, Director Burlow, was there anything that you needed to add to this? You did a good job there, Daryl. No, there isn't. Thank you both very okay. much. Um, this isn't um, a motion on the agenda, but it is an agenda item. So I do want to give um, any committee members with very specific questions um, to this um, to be able to answer them. Um, we, <laughs> you guys, you're getting ahead of yourselves. I didn't tell you if we're doing the hand way or the alphabetical way now. All right. So this is not second grade. Who picked me? Okay. We will go with hands and member Woodland's laughter. Um, but to, to 
keep this discussion and and um, Member Smith, if we can keep this particular discussion to 20 minutes, I'd appreciate it. So Member Woodland with her hand first. Thank you. I, I was just basing it off of how we did the last one with the hand. So, um, I just have uh, uh, two questions. One is about um, if the comments have been analyzed yet and will the school committee have access to the open-ended questions that were part of that survey? Um, and then also I have a question about why the pre-K students were not separated out from K through two because um, my understanding is that pre-K was in, was all but fully in person um, for the first quarter. Maybe not fully in person, maybe it was really hybrid, but it was quite a different setup than K through two. So I would just like to know why they were lumped together. And that's all. Thank you. Yeah, I think primarily they were lumped together because we, you know, again, pre-K two, three, five, oftentimes that's how we um, kind of organize it. But I see what you're saying, Linda. We could definitely you know, define that, um, you know, in terms of the open responses, we are pulling those and, you know, going through that. We're definitely, we can share those with school committee. That's, that's not an issue. Thank you so much. My second fastest hand, um, member Gustafson. Again, I was follow. I was exactly what Linda said. I was following the process. I'm sorry. Um, I have uh, questions, two questions. Um, were any definitions provided? Because some of the questions are somewhat subjective in terms of what is effective. Um, so I wondered if we gave parents, I don't think we did from my recollection, um, if they were given any guidance in terms of what would be considered effective or what measures we would be using, or if it was just open-ended and subjective. Um, that was open-ended. Okay. Um, second, um, I don't think there were any questions asking about the amount of support needed to access the material independently. So I would be curious if the questions reflected that at all. Um, and then my third um, question was that you had said in the intervention section, um, you talked about increasing the cohort D students. So I would like to request some more information on how you plan to do that, um, since that is one of my ongoing concerns um, that there are I, that's the first I've heard of that. So I'd be curious what your plan is for that in terms of dates, in terms of who those students might be um, and, and how that would be handled. So Thank some you. more details specifically on the cohort D students who you may be increasing, Dr. McCall. Sure. So um, as we kind of have worked with our building principals over the past several weeks, one of the concerns that has uh, come up and you can tell from these um, these charts, you know, in reference to uh, you know, maybe learning effectiveness or, uh, you know, students just not feeling as though they're making that connection. So principals have been very vocal about trying to get those kids back in. So we're looking at how we can do that um, sometime in January. If the January 19th date, um, date holds, um, you know, looking at whether or not we could do something then. If not, uh, and it goes farther down the road, um, you know, again, bringing small groups of students in prior to that time. So it's really about providing support for students who are having a challenging time to begin with. And, uh, you know, again, we don't want to set uh, any of our students up, um, you know, any, any more challenging you know, or have any more of a challenging time than they're already having. Thank you, Dr. McCall, and thank you, Member Gustafson, for that. Member Kirshenbaum, you would lose in the Wild West. Go ahead. <laughs> I was being polite and respectful, actually. <laughs> um, so I just um, want to reemphasize uh, the urgency uh, with that cohort, with that Group D. Um, I feel that, uh, you know, we've had a term with them. Uh, teachers have had a term with them. They knew that they were struggling, I would imagine, based on data and the attendance records and so forth. So this is just more evidence that uh, that families are struggling. Um, and I, I really don't have a good answer for our constituents on why that group has not yet been expanded. Um, why can't, uh, why are we still talking about January 19th for that group? That's the second quarter done. I would, I would really urge the uh, administration to move rather uh, efficiently uh, with that group. Thank you. Oh, and just, just to, you know, real quick, um, you know, I, prior to that, I said that it would be, you know, 
earlier Jan- earlier in January, or if the date got pushed back, it would be you know maybe around the 19th um, at that time when other kids were coming in later. So that's exactly what we're looking at. Thank you, Dr. McCall. And I think you have Member Christianbaum's strong advisement to do that as soon as possible. <laughs> okay. okay, good. Um, I have um, Member Pantos and then Member Haber, please. Excellent point brought up by Member Christianbaum. Uh, I'm not too familiar with the cohorts, I will admit, and uh, some of the different definitions I hear can be uh, conflicting at times. Uh, is there any, I have two questions. The first being, is there any separation from uh, student data regarding students with 504s and IEPs, special needs, and how their parents feel that uh, the learning has been going? Uh, no, so that wasn't defined per se, um, but when we're looking at this by um, you know cohorts, so cohort A, cohort B, cohort C, cohort D, um, when we're talking about a cohort D group, that's a group um, that, again, for the different criteria that I talked about in the slide, uh, students that are having problems with attendance, students that are having, um, you know, problems with some of their, uh, not some of their scores, but um, their um, academics. Uh, you know, we're also looking at um, some of the information associated with social emotional support. And then <clears throat> really other ones who are just tuned out, um, students who are just kind of off the radar because they're, they don't have to be in school. So, um, and you know what, Mike, those definitely might include students on 504s and IEPs. And again, what we're trying to do is provide the most support to those students as well. Okay. Uh, my other question is, is there any way to verify parents answered these questions? I do see a good percentage saying they want less time in school. Any way to verify? Um, yeah, just ask, uh, and uh, let me just check with Director Scalar on that. I'm not sure, Barry, if how that kind of played out in terms of how this went out. It, I believe it goes out to um, to parents' emails. Parents' emails, yes. All right, lightening the mood a little bit, but thank you. He's nodding, but yes, member okay. can let us, your smile indicates uh, exactly what some of us may be thinking. Um, Member Haber, please. Uh, just a quick question. Um, I was hoping that um, we will see more more students in cohort D. Um, and it's my understanding, at least at the high school, that there are kids that are having trouble that are already going in um, for intervention and help with academics specifically. Um, I've also been told by parents that uh, they've been told that there's no space in those classes right now and that they'll have to wait uh, until we can open something else up. So I'm curious how it's being determined um, who's allowed to go in uh, and if it truly is a space consideration for actual classroom space, a space consideration because we don't have a teacher to teach it. Um, but obviously if they've been told that they qualify and then they're told that there's not room. It doesn't seem like that's an adequate answer. Yeah. And I, I, I hear what you're saying about that, Sherry, that doesn't make any sense. So I will, and again, whether or not, I don't know if Deputy Berlow knows the response to that, he can jump in. Um, but I can tell you um, there are um, students who have been totally not engaged at the high school that um, uh, principal Biendo has brought in to, it work, you know, again, work remotely still, but there are, there are adults who are watching. They're not teachers, but they're um, substitutes who are supporting them um, while they're, you know, in that space and they're still learning all their, rem they're doing all of their schooling remotely. Um, so that's how that kind of plays out. Bob, I didn't know if you had any more information on the other question. I do not. And Sherry, that's nice. okay. Thank you both so much. Um, and, and to Member Gustafson in the chat, um, please do put on any of these um, as we spoke about last meeting. If it's a formal request for information, please do email me because it, it gets muddled after a multi-hour meeting. Next on our agenda this evening is a report um, from the administration on 
uh, elementary and middle school schedules and why there could be inconsistency in these schedules. So is this a PowerPoint or are we just going to chat through this one? We're, we're going to go through, <laughs> we're going to do, um, we just have one long PowerPoint today. All so, right, let's um, keep going. Director Keenan, if you can bring that up, that'd be great. And if someone could let me know when it's up. Next time you got to use a pair deck, Dr. McCall, and mix it up a bit. I know. I know. You got to get with the times here. Yeah, I need internet. <laughs> Again, come on to Princeton. Um, Member Haber, you can speak to it after. Um, it's not a motion, um, so we're going to let the administration speak first. So is it up and running? Not yet. We're waiting. We're waiting on this tech. Bob, Brendan, are you guys with us? I'm with you. I'm going to go grab it now. I was waiting for Brendan. If I'm grabbing it, I can't talk, though, so I'll go get it now. I'm sorry. It's had a connectivity issue. Um, <laughs> you need for me. I apologize. You guys are both losing in our, our fast draw in the Wild West. Yeah. All right, here we go. Thank you. One moment till they get to the right one. Bob, we're on slide 24. Yep, I think he's just about there. He's got a lot of tabs rolling. Good to go, Daryl. Oh, now you can move over to Google Meets. All right, now we're here. Go ahead. Okay, so again, um, basically an overview of elementary and middle school schedules. Um, there have been some questions about our schedules toward the beginning of the year in reference to um, middle schools in particular. Um, and you know, why some middle schools had different times uh, than other middle schools. So what we wanted to do is just kind of go through this. So Bob, if you can move to slide 25. I'll set. Okay. So <clears throat> this is really the overview, you know, in terms of both uh, elementary and middle. So all schools begin the year with a remote schedule that included um, all afternoons had extra support time for small groups and individual students, as well as extension activities. So there weren't classes necessarily already established. All schools scheduled a half day on Wednesday that did not include any student learning time in the afternoon. Remote schedules did not have defined times for synchronous versus asynchronous learning, which was only recently defined by DESE, and I'll talk about that a little later. And this entire schedule was approved by DESE when, when um, this was put forth. So again, um, when everything was pulled together, as um, our, the schools went into um, the September, October, I think schedules were a, a little less structured uh, in terms of bringing kids back into school and um, being in that remote model. So in slide 26, okay, thank you. So for elementary schedules, um, when, when we're talking about this, you know, currently, um, you know, although they're consistent, with 300 minutes, you know, approximately per day, which is basically where they need to be. Um, every schedule is a little different and it, it's building to building and grade level to grade level. And by different, um, it means that there are different blocks of time set up during a schedule, during a day associated with reading. Um, you know, so at the elementary level, typically it's a language arts block. There's a writing block that might accompany that, or it might be at a different section. Uh, there's math that is in there. Uh, some places have specific, you know, a 10 minute SEL block of time that they, they build in um, for a teacher to do that, or other schools have it built into their um, morning meeting time. So it's, it's a challenge to, you know, it's not apples to apples when you're looking at um, the various schools. Wednesday afternoons have uh, scheduled asynchronous coursework now, so that's something that uh, is in there permanently. All lunch periods are consistent, so they have 30 minutes of time for uh, lunch every day. And all schools have a more defined structure learning time for all grade levels you know, in their afternoon blocks. So Bob, if you move to the next slide, 
This was the sample elementary schedule from the reopening plan. And as you can see, it's structured in the morning, but then in the afternoon, it was really set aside for a small group, individual, directed, you know, direct instruction um, with individuals uh, and also small groups. And um, it was uh, purposefully left open so that there was the opportunity for teachers to work with kids um, who might be struggling. On the next slide, this is a sample of a current elementary schedule. So, and you know, and as you can see, you have uh, morning meeting time, um, there's a math, there's a break time, there's then reading and writing. So there's a block from 1030 to 1210. There's a half an hour lunch. This has a, this um, grade level has uh, a read aloud time. They have a science and a social studies time. There's still a structured learning time that's built in. And again, this is because we're remote. So this gives the opportunity for a teacher to have, to be available, but be able to say, okay, I'm gonna work with this small group. This, you know, you're going to be doing something um, over here asynchronously and then jumping back in. And then at the end of the day, there's a related art or a special. So that's art, music, or PE. On, um, let's see, slide 29. So that's when we're looking at middle school schedules, um, you know, what we did was we looked at just, you know, grade seven um, as the as the one that we, we focus on because we had six, seven, and eight. Um, and the way it basically breaks down, um, all the all the schools have about a 45-minute period on a daily basis. Again, it's a little different depending upon the school as it is during the regular school year, you know, pre-COVID times. We have a 30-minute lunch. Wednesday afternoons have the scheduled asynchronous coursework time. And Monday, Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, um, those afternoons now have scheduled class time. So on slide 30, you have um, sample middle school schedule for reopening. And that's straight from the uh, plan that was sent to DESE. And again, it's similar to that elementary plan where you had 845 to 1155 basically um, structured learning time in terms of um, classes per se. And then the afternoons were set aside for indiv individual learning, direct learning, small group, uh, where the teacher was available, but they were working with different groups of kids. On the next slide, this is a current middle school schedule. And, you know, as you can see, it, there's actually um, blocks of time that are set aside for various periods all the way through the end of the day to that structured learning time that's set aside again for small group instruction and so forth. So this is a, this is a schedule that is um, similar across the board in all of our middle schools. On the next slide, this is, you know, the part that, you know, as we kind of think about moving into the hybrid model, so uh, this past week, um, DESE passed um, a new regulation around hybrid and remote direct live instruction time with students. So um, for hybrid, it's a minimum of 35 hours of live instruction over 10 days. So basically 3.5 hours a day on average. And then remote, it's a minimum of 40 hours of live instruction over 10 days. And this is four point hours um, per day uh, on average. Again, this goes into effect uh, January 19th. Um, all school districts in the state have to be following uh, these these regulations. And um, I know it's something that we're um, you know going to be able to do in terms of uh, giving all of this up. Start times for schools, those are going to return to the pre-COVID times. So the start times and end times when the buses run. Um, that's going to be back onto that typical cycle. Once the schedules are developed, they're going to remain the same regardless of the learning model being utilized. And again, that goes back to that 35, 40 hour time. We're really looking to have 40 hours of um, the live instruction time be the, the baseline for um, both hybrid and remote so that we do not have to switch schedules and, and change times around if we do have to switch from one model to another. And then hybrid schedules for each school, those are all going to be made available to families prior to the students returning to school. So that will be shared with them um, beforehand. Thank you, Bob. That was a nice job putting that through. Thank you very much. Member Haber put this on the agenda. It was her request. Um, would you like to speak first, please? 
Uh, yes, I, um, I'm happy that all these changes have been made. Um, I originally brought this up to administration on October 20th, and I um, obviously changes have been made since then. Uh, but I think it needs to be made clear to school committee and to parents that uh, there are differences between our schools. Um, you know, my kids are in Rutland and, and at the high school, and I felt good when I read their plans and they were full day uh, for remote. Uh, but then I hear from a parent in Holden who has their child in a middle school, and they, are, they were only receiving instruction in the mornings. Um, and in the afternoons, they were available for extra help if needed. Um, they were upset to find out that Rutland kids were getting full day instruction and they weren't. Um, Glenwood had afternoons optional. I don't know how that was allowed. Um, I understand that building principals need to uh, have control over their buildings, but I think the administration needs to set regulations and I think they should have set regulations on FaceTime with teachers before Desi did. Um, I want to make sure that going forward, the hybrid schedules are are better. Um, I'm hoping that they're going to be consistent. Um, you know, today I, I had a discussion with Deputy Brillo, and I'm happy to see the information he put together for me. Um, but he even brought to a point that our district runs as separate schools under an umbrella uh, and not as a true district. And my hope is that that is going to change. Thank you very much, Member Haber. Um, Member Pantos had a hand. I was just curious, uh, Mr. McCall, if parents will be able to make a decision between remote and hybrid after seeing their new schedules, once those schedules are finalized. I haven't thought about that yet, um, Member Pantos, but I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to process that one a little bit. I would highly encourage that that be an option. Thank you. Thank you. Um, member Altmark, please. Uh, just quick question. The 35 hours live instruction for hybrid versus 40 hours for remote live instruction. Is that for the model or is that for the students in the cohort? So like if the district were in hybrid, but parents mm -hmm. keep their kids remote, are they get, is that the 40 hours for them? So I don't know. If, I know that Dustin no, just put this out. So. It's the predominant model that's being used. So if you're hybrid, it's hybrid. So it, you know, technically it's at 35 hours. And again, the 35 hours is an average over, um, over grades one through 12. Thank All you. Right, that's, thank you. that's a good clarifier though. So, um, next on our agenda tonight, and I believe this is the last thing on the regular agenda before executive session is a quick update on the SOA. I think we have one more slide. We do have one more slide, okay. So Deputy Berlo, if you can just bring that up real quick. Poor Bob tonight. I don't know what Linda had a hand up. Oh, Linda, do you want to ask your question while I was bringing it up? Um, if you don't mind, I very much appreciate it. Um, for the current remote model now, are we hitting that 40 hour mark? Um, and if, if not, are we close? Yeah, we're, we're pretty close. And again, I think, you know, in order to look at this, because it's averaged out over all the grades, it's, it, that's where it becomes a little more of a challenge. But um, as we kind of define it better, um, we'll definitely we'll definitely hit that target. All set, Daryl. I believe I got it. Thank you, Annette. Your slide is up, Daryl. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So um, again, Student Opportunity Act. Boy, uh, we haven't talked about this in a while. Uh, it was something that. <laughs> was uh, brought forth last year and was, um, you know, we had started to have a conversation around it before we ended up uh, closing schools for COVID. Um, and so ultimately the Student Opportunity Act, uh, this was postponed from last spring, it's now due January 15th. Uh, one of the things that we'll be doing is gathering public feedback on the SOA. Uh, because again, that's something that's a, a requirement associated with this. So we'll be sending something out very soon. It's actually the document that I was going to send out um, back in March before they postponed uh, the student opportunity. They postponed it to this date. It's actually been postponed several times. 
So an updated SOA information packet will be shared with the full school committee the first week of January, um, once that's better defined. And then you will vote, the school committee will vote on uh, the SOA funds on January 11th. And again, I cannot guarantee that those funds, you know, moving forward at any time are going to be available in terms of how that kind of plays out, because that has been the, I guess, the $64,000 question um, that the commissioner has been discussing with superintendents since, gosh, last March. Um, our SOA dollar amount was in the $400,000 range. Um, uh, many school districts were, uh, you know, in the million plus dollar range. So there were two different forms to fill out. If you had $1.5 million or above, you had to fill out a long form. If you were below the $1.5 million, you filled out a short form. So um, most of that information is already ready to go. Um, you know, I've been sitting on this since last March. So we're, we'll just get the feedback from um, the community and share the information with school committee. Thank you for that update. Any specific questions for this update? All right. Megan, I have a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, couldn't oh, unmute. I, I almost made it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm quick though. Um, I was just. I'm glad to hear we're getting public feedback. Um, I was just curious if um, the things in the plan, if any of them have been impacted by things that have happened during the closures in COVID, if any of our needs have changed or how we might use the funds. Great question, actually, Malaya. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're actually looking at how we can better support some of the tech uh, around some of our our neediest students as well as, you know, looking to see whether or not we can provide more um, SEL support, ultimately, because that was one of the main pushes that we had for this before uh, COVID. And we are realizing even more so in this, in this kind of state that we're in, that at the elementary level, not having um, elementary counselors to help support these kids in any situation is just so detrimental to their me overall mental health. So we want to ensure that we, you know, if we had those funds, we're able to put them toward those positions. Thank you. Great question. Oh, member Ember. Uh, Daryl, for we're actually in in you know the four hundred thousand dollar range. Um, <sighs> Are, are other districts looking to legally challenge how, how this is determined? I mean, it sounds to me like it's woefully inadequate and really, really inappropriate. And, and you know, again, this was meant to be um, some method for, for the state because the state was being challenged in, in a lot of all sorts of, of groups and, and committees, legislative committees came out and said that the formulas were really uh, very warped. And, and you know, I've worked on this issue for like lots of years. And we, we know that um, it, it's highly problematic, both in terms of um, regional agreements and, and how that affects us particularly, um, and just in general across the state. So, so what legal recourses do we have? What are other districts doing? Um, I guess I'm looking for a lot more information about how it actually can be challenged um, and what our role as a school committee is in this process. Thanks. So I guess, you know, Bob, I've not heard about this being challenged because, uh, again, this has been around since, you know, it's well over a year that, you know, we've been aware of uh, the SOA. Um, the, you know, it, how it kind of plays out in terms of uh, equity um, and again, I think this comes down to the funding formula, which is probably what you're referring to. Um, yes, this was a way to try to provide more support to uh, school districts that um, are considered to be, um, I, let's just say, not as um, fiscally, not I, I wouldn't say fiscally sound, but um, more students with free and reduced lunch, um, a more challenging population to help support. And I think we, our district does not necessarily fall into that category. So I can definitely, I'll talk with um, the MARS, the Massachusetts Regional School District Association, and kind of go through that with them. Um, and I can also reach out to our local legislators, Bob. 
Okay, because I mean, I, I believe the fundamental issue initially, I mean, there are two, two issues. One is that the state has been dramatically underfunding schools. And that was an issue a lot of years ago. They got caught doing it then. It's the same issue. And, and so there's dramatic underfunding for all students. And then there's a secondary issue of, of uh, the formulas for regional districts and how that's calculated. And that's probably not part of this, but maybe it ought to have been. And, and I, you know, certainly uh, Senator Chandler would, would be a ideal support mechanism for that as well. Um, and, and also um, our representative that's that's over in um, Barry. Yeah. So Senator Gobi. Yeah. Right, exactly so. So and, and how that affects rural districts of, of which we're affected. But thank you. Thank okay. you. Both. Thank you, Bob. Thank that's you a good good point. point. Um, Member Gustafson, a quick one. Very quick. Um, I did want to clarify, I don't know if this informs Bob at all or not, but I know that when we the funds were estimated, I know ours were targeted specifically towards students with disabilities, primarily as our um, group that they were would be intended to benefit. Yeah. Um, I don't recall the exact numbers and how that worked out, but whereas you know low income districts are targeted based on free and reduced lunch, ours was mostly targeted specifically towards students with disabilities. Um, and I don't know if, if that's been changed or if that helps you at all, but I recall that from the spring discussions. Thank you. Um, but this is definitely something for us as a school committee and for the administration to continuously follow up on. Um, and I don't mind reaching out to Ann, Ann and Kim. They've been wonderful. Okay. With that, um, do we have a motion uh, next on the agenda is to adjourn into executive session to discuss potential litigation and to report on the progress and negotiations with the Wachusett Regional Education Association, WREA, on 2020-2021 school reopening as the chair deems discussion in public session would have an adverse effect on the district bargaining position not to return into public session. So moved. Second. It's been moved and uh, there is not an executive session link today. I'll go over that after we vote. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Member Ayala. Ayala, yes. Member Bennett. Bennett, yes. Member Brown. Brown, yes. Member Dennis? Dennis, yes. Member Gustafson? Yes. Member Haber? Haber, yes. Member Imber? Imber, yes. Member Kirschenbaum? Kirschenbaum, yes. Member Lavoy? Lavoy, yes. Member Longbelil? Yes. Member Mill? Yes. Member Mitchell? Yes. Member Otmar? Yes. Member Pantos? Yes. Member Shapiro? Shapiro, yes. Member Smith? Smith, yes. Member Sullivan? Yes. Member uh, Williamson? Yes. Member Woodland? Woodland, yes. Member Young? Is Adam still with us? Sorry, yes. Okay, and the chair votes yes. Um, I would now ask anybody who's not a member of the school committee to drop off this call, please, or administration. Everybody else, stay tight for a minute. And Megan, can you stop recording? I can't, but um, Madam Secretary can. Sure.